so we, like many parks and recreation agencies across the country, face an uncertain future as the way to normal um, is definitely changing each day. When asked our parks and recreation facility, I simply answered yes of the number of individuals that we serve, the impact that we have on our lives every day, and the importance that we add to the health and wellness of our community. So today, the purpose of this retreat is to look at where we've been and to identify where we want to go as one commission, as one team. Today, we'll start off with building a stronger foundation um, for our board to continue to do the great work by having our attorney, Mr. Lawrence Flynn, to present to the board board governance. This gives you the opportunity to refresh some of those things that you've already been exposed to. And then also, how do we move forward um, as an agency to accomplish the many goals that we have before us? And then we will be introduced to you sports tourism. I'm excited about this presentation. We do feel as a county that we have many opportunities to serve as a hub for sports. Not only youth sports, but adult sports as well. So today we'll be hearing some of the things that we've been tournaments we've been able to bring, um, but also what we think we need in order to bring even more. And then lastly, we will close out with our accomplishments over the last past fiscal year, as well as how we have been able to survive um, during COVID-19. And then one day we will move into the final part of our retreat where we will focus on capital improvement projects and our operating budget as we identify strategies to move forward. Uh, so with that, I would like to take this opportunity to introduce Mr. Lawrence Flynn, and I will allow him to give you his background as we move forward with the first part of our retreat. Uh, Chairman Lupine, are there any words that you would like to say? Yeah, thank you very much for putting this on. I know we have been uh, trying to put this together for quite a while, so congratulations to everybody for making this happen. Um, it's nice. I, I think this is the first time I've sat in the middle this table since uh, I became chairman. So it's good to be there right together. And I'm like the plastic and everything that you've done with precaution. So thank you very much, like I said. And uh, let's record a productive day. And thank you. Yes, sir. Mr. Turner. All right, there we are. I'll take this down because I like to walk around a little bit. I walk over towards y'all. I'm on the back of that. Um, I'm Lawrence Flynn. I'm an attorney with the Coach Flynn Law Firm uh, here in Columbia. With me today, I've got Sarah Weathers, uh, my associate, to keep me on the straight and narrow to kind of walk through this discussion. Um, she pulled together some information that I think will be fairly helpful as we go through the discussion today. So, not only does it have the presentation materials that I've that we put together that you'll have here as a kind of background. It also has a copy of the enabling legislation of uh, the district. And we'll talk about what that enabling legislation is and why that's important. Then it also has um, a series of, of draft policy proposals working with staff over the last couple of months to pull together, which I think are also part of the discussion we're going to get into today about um, what policies are probably necessary for the organization to continue the process of moving forward. So I'll say that we are here in a board retreat, and my goal is to foster as much discussion um, as we possibly can, because I don't think as board members and everyone is still relatively new to this process. Most of the staff, or at least most of the executive staff, is new. Um, and so Lakita and I have had some of these conversations uh, in the last year, but I'm not really sure that the board is, is, has kind of got a wholesome understanding of what it is to be a special purpose district. I don't necessarily know if staff has that, that knowledge either. So I'll say on the front end, I have a tendency to run off of the mouth, and I've got two hours otherwise given to me. If we need to take a break, let's take a break. If I say something that doesn't make sense, I'll repeat it and see if I can say it in a way that does make sense. If you have a question, ask it. Because I think this stuff is, I do it a lot. There's lots of special purpose districts all over the state. It's intuitive to me because I live it every single day, but a lot of this stuff is actually not intuitive. You think, man, why did it happen like this? Why are we doing things this way? And there is a, a history to it. And the good news is 
I was a history major as an undergrad. And since I wanted to actually make some money in life, I went to law school. <laughs> but I get to tell a history lesson here today, too. So that actually, I think, is really helpful for purposes of helping understand how you've gotten to where you are today, what your purpose is as commissioner, what your purpose is as staff, what the great kind of benefit of special purpose districts are in the general setting. Um, and I think from that, my goal is, as we get out of this portion of the border tree, it'll help with the process for the discussion on Monday as you start talking about capital planning. Because at the end of the day, that is inherently what I do. I'm a bond lawyer by trade, which is just a fancy name for a lawyer that helps people borrow money. Um, and, and the capital planning, because you are a governmental body, um, the, the improvements in capital and facilities is with your tax base. And so if, if we start thinking through all of the assets and facilities, because you know, if you start looking at the size of this county, you start looking at the assets that you had, you start thinking about the fact that you've been in existence for 50 some odd years, that costs money. There are legitimate big dollars that are associated with running this organization. And it's not something that you can just kind of put it on a shelf. These are depreciating assets. These are staff that you know are trying to take care of their family. And so those costs are going to continue to escalate. And we still have to figure out how you know, we'd be more strategic about where our capital is deployed, how we spend it, and what new projects we have. So that would be Brandy's discussion on Monday. I will not be here for, for that portion of it, but there may be some a little bit of overlap just to kind of understand that, and then we'll probably follow it back up with a subsequent discussion, probably in a board meeting at some point in the not too distant future to start talking about how we actually issue bonds or or, or increase tax levy authorization what happens. With that. My goal is not to rely on slides too much, but I do actually think this helps for purposes of being able to get through the discussion. So y'all may have to help me here. How do I do I click the punch? Where do I where do I point? The arrow to the right. Arrow to the right. Got it. <laughs> All right, so that one switched. Or these switching too? Does someone switch with me? Perfect. All right. So as I said, we're going to talk about history first and foremost, because I think. With respect to special purpose districts, the important consideration that you really need to think through is how you're created. And so the, the history lesson, and this goes back way far, this like goes back to the start of local government as a as just a kind of general theory. Um, in South Carolina, we operate now under the 1895 Constitution. So there's you know, you got a federal constitution, then all the states obviously. But you know, this greater state right here in the South, we believe in making sure the states have responsibilities. And so we've had for constitutional commissions. The most recent constitutional commission in South Carolina was in 1895. That is the constitution that we operate under today. In the 1895 constitution, they basically recognized several forms of government. You had the state, you had cities, so municipalities that had kind of broad powers to do lots of things. You had counties, which were considered agencies of the state, basically acting on behalf of, of, of the state to implement and, and roll out projects and procedures that they had. And then you had special purpose districts that kind of came about as a result of the limitations of, of counties. And you know, a lot of times what you'll hear, especially old timers, uh, when they start talking about counties that it didn't have very many powers, you know, the, the county supervisor or the county administrator used to be called the, the road supervisor. Is because really the only power the counties had until March 7th, 1973, was the authorization to pay roads. Um, they had some limited policing powers, which were very paupers, uh, people that died without, without income. The responsibility was to pay the roads in the state, which meant that counties didn't have fire, you know, power to provide fire service. They didn't have the ability to provide sewer service. They didn't have the ability to provide water service. And obviously, they didn't have the ability to provide recreation. And so understanding that as the baseline, because this inherent conflict that has gone on with this organization for a long time, and that's not just paying lip service to it, there, there's a real conflict. There have been lawsuits between this organization and the county. There's still some approval oversight that still happened as a result of your relationship with the county. Um, but obviously the legislative delegation comes into that discussion as well. All of that comes into play through this. Um, and so because the county didn't have the ability to uh, provide recreation services, what would happen is, is you would find areas of the state where um, 
certain you know, necessary services were. So you had the city of Columbia, which as a city had the ability to do water, sewer, fire, police, recreation. That's the reason that the core service area doesn't include outside the incorporated limits of the city of Columbia because the city had that power under the 1895 constitution. The county did not. And so what happened was, and this is this is the essence of the way that our state operated for a really, really long time, um, is when you needed to have um, social services deployed in a particular area, you would call your local senator, who was the most powerful person in your particular county, and they would say, hey, we need to be able to do recreation services in you know, the personal road area. Well, that's not an incorporated uh, city of Columbia. We need, we need baseball uh, facilities, or we need basketball facilities, or we need tennis facilities. And the, and, the, and the legislative delegation, generally acting through the center, would say, yeah, we put a line item appropriation in from the, from the state budget. We create a one-off organization. We task it with a bunch of our buddies. That's the reason that they're appointed by the governor on the recommendation of the And then they had kind of this consortium that they could control, put assets on the ground in their various communities. And then they got to appoint the commissioners to be able to make decisions as to how they roll out their assets. And that's not unique to you. There's like 800 some odd special purpose districts operating in South Carolina today. If you go up to Spartanburg County or Greenville County, that's probably the place where there's the most of them. And the reason for that is you can kind of see it a little bit more strategically up there. Um, you have you know, the city of Spartanburg, you have the city of Greenville. Um, but in Spartanburg County, they have 37 independently operating fire districts. Well, that, so that includes the city of Spartanburg. But that's 37 independently operated special districts because what they had, they had a whole bunch of mill villages. And so the mill villages typically popped up around areas that were beside streams, the river tributaries, because they needed a discharge into the river. Well, they also had a need for fire service or sewer service or water service. The county didn't do it. So they created these independent districts. So you have 37 fire districts still operating as far as seven water districts operating as far So so there's a, a regional sewer provider, same thing in Greenville, but Greenville has the same problem going on uh, with their fire. They actually had fire and sewer. It's, it's kind of across the board. There are not a lot of independent recreation. You got the uh, Lexington County uh, Department of Recreation and Aging, which I don't even know what aging is as a, as a policy. Mm -hmm. Charleston County has a large recreation district, and obviously you do as well. But in other areas, recreation, this simply was kind of disregarded in some of those upstate counties that was largely done by the city, and it could be done by the city outside their municipal boundaries by some. So I say all that to give you the background as to how you were created, and that was done by Act 8, uh, 873 of 1960. And what you'll see is in the packet of information that I that I gave you today, um, what is it? behind tab one right there? Okay. Behind tab A, um, there is a list of your Statutory enabling legislation. Oh, that's the. Sorry. The <laughs> <laughs> There's a list of your statutory enabling legislation, which is this act, uh, 873 of 1960. And then through time, to give you new powers, it's been amended. And over and over and over and over again. So 16 times that we can find in going back through the, 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 the books of statutory changes through the years. So the, the interesting thing about a special purpose district is you are what's considered a Dillon's rule entity, as opposed to a home rule. So you probably heard that term home rule before, and cities have home rule power. Home rule means that you have the authorization to rule from home, meaning that you have all of those powers that are not otherwise prohibited by the Constitution or the legislature. So if you're a city, you can provide fire service, you can provide recreation. Um, you can write tickets, you can um, uh, institute special fees, you can sell property, you can buy property, you can basically do anything you want so long as it's not prohibited. For example, a city can't go out and create its own um, traffic laws. That's obviously preempted by the state. The state dictates what, what municipal speed limits are. They have the, the state law blue ticket book. You can call speeding, you write it on a state, state ticket, and you process locally, but it's, it's done on the state board. That's that is the, the one the kind of the, the example of how the state is restricted. As a special purpose district, you don't have home rule power. You have what's known as dual power, which 
which means that you are a creature of statute. And that means that you only have those powers that have been expressly provided to you by the legislature. So if it's not written in the enabling legislation that created this organization, you don't have that power. And that's an important thing to remember because folks will say, well, you know, we, we're, we now have home rule in South Carolina. And you can argue whether or not we actually have home rule for checks on fiscal autonomy, tax levies, and all kinds of things. But as a special purpose district, and what I typically refer to as the redheaded stepchild of local government, you are limited to what you can do. And that's an important, important consideration because as we start looking at this, I mentioned we're going to talk about your naming legislation, which is this. And then we're also going to talk about general legislation. And why is that why is that important? Well, the reason is is because we talk about we're going to talk about history lesson. Counties in under the Home Rule Act amendments, our new Article 10 was enacted in 1973, actually March 7th of 1973, basically ceded authorization. Now remember they didn't have all these powers before, ceded home rule powers to the county. And so there's a constitutional commission. We amended the South Carolina Constitution with respect to local government, and they passed the South Carolina Local Government Act and gave counties home rule power, which then meant counties can now do fire service, they can now do water service, they can now do sewer service, subject reference, they can now do recreation service. But what you can't have is overlapping functions of government. So to the extent that you have special purpose districts that are already in place, they can't encroach upon the power that you have because in the implementation authorization of the country. All these special purpose districts, we recognize that, and we're just going to kind of hold them in abeyance. We're not getting rid of them. The powers that, you know, the organizations that were created, you know, you've been, you've been in existence for 15 years at that point, you build assets, you have been doing things. Um, we're going to just kind of let you lie out there and wait. Well, that's all fine and good with, in, in the big scheme of things because it satiated the special purpose districts that were in existence as of 73. But as we now fast forward 40 years later, what that means is, is that you can no longer pass laws affecting a single county um, and have them be legal. And that's an important consideration because the way you create special purpose districts is by special legislation. And when you are a special purpose district only operating within Richland County, laws that are implemented to affect you and give you authorization are now unconstitutional if they're put in place after March 7th, 1973. And so you'll see here on this list of outstanding acts, most of them happened in the 60s. And a lot of those were talked about where your service territory was, talked about how we implement and approve our board membership. And we'll talk about those a little more specifically here in a minute. And then it also authorized tax levy. It also authorized the ability to issue debt. It also authorizes the ability to move service boundaries or what happens if you get annexed into by another municipality. But then as you get outside of 1973, you'll see here you still have a number of pieces of special legislation that continue to get enacted. And that's because the senators who historically had all this power to go off and haul off and pass a piece of special legislation didn't like getting rid of their control. And so we've seen that very specifically. And in fact, this act. 2007 or 2005, we'll talk about it in a minute, has been expressly challenged by this organization. This act right here changed the constitution of the board because in 67, this act, they added uh, some additional commissioners to the original five to go to seven. Um, and on uh, the terms of it, that act transitioned the appointment authority from the Richland County Legislative Delegation to Richland County Council. Well, that meant that the people that appoint you, you all got appointed, you know, recommended by a legislative delegation, appointed by the governor. They devolved that power from the legislative delegation to the county, because the county was raising hell about them having to approve your budget and, and all the rest of taxes. And so that authorization got transitioned. Well, the former administration of this organization said, we're not going to let you just come and vote out all of our commissioners. And so they actually brought suit on that. It was ruled unconstitutional. And there's a whole litany of cases out there that expressly state that all amendments to special purpose districts occurring in a single county post March 7, 1973 are explicitly unconstitutional. The problem is, is that if an act is passed, it's deemed valid until change. So it's actually valid law until you have to bring a lawsuit against it to undo it or overturn it. And that creates problems for special purpose districts. 
where you are, you haven't been able to have a piece of of game changing legislation that affects you in now going on 40, 40 some odd years. And so you're still operating under this authorization that existed, you know, 60 years ago. Um, so the only way now under the Constitution that you can amend the operation and existence of a special purpose district is you have to pass a general law, which means that you have to pass a law through the legislature that affects all special purpose districts across the entire state. That's a problem because things that affect you independently in Richland County may not apply in Charleston or may not apply in London or may not apply if it has a general piece of special purpose district legislation that affects fire districts. You know, that, that, that doesn't mean anything to you as a recreation provider. Um, and so it becomes really disjointed as to how new authorizations put in place. Unfortunately, with that kind of history lesson behind us, that's where we stand. That's the status from which. We need to operate. Any questions on this? So it's a really kind of interesting historical perspective about how all this has rolled out. So let's look about this commission in particular because I think that's an important entry for you all. So under the original enabling act. The authorization for this organization was that they gave uh, in 1960 five members recommended by the legislative delegation. I think it was actually the senator uh, at the time and appointed by the governor. Then there was an amendment in 67 where they actually, excuse me, there was an amendment in 61 where they added the authorization for the county supervisor who was the road paper at the time. They had five members plus the county supervisor. And so it operated like that for a couple of years. And then in 67, they said, no. County supervisor doesn't need to be part of this, and they added two more commissions. And that's that's the way that you've operated, that's the way that this board um, is currently currently on uh, the 2007 Act. Um, but that's the way it works. And so you get recommended by the legislative delegation, appointed by the governor for whatever terms that you'll have. And so that's that's been in place. Um, there was an amendment in 76 that is also invalid, but it just simply changes the legislative delegation as opposed to this language the majority of the House and Senate representatives of the county. It's a distinction without a difference if you ask me, because that is the legislative delegation effectively. Um, so you could actually challenge the 76 Act, and it would then devolve you to the 67 Act because it goes back to the most recently valid enactment that would be in place. But there's no reason to do that. You'd be I don't pretend to have all the history or the understanding because I've only started doing work for the district here in the last couple of years. Um, but I know there has been lots of conflict through time with, with the county. And, and one of those major reasons was the county didn't like the fact that they had the requirement to approve your budget. And I think that is still an ongoing saga to this day. Um, had the budget, but didn't have any control over the members who were making decisions as to how that budget was ultimately employed. Um, and so they, which is strange to me because the legislative delegation typically likes to maintain the degree of control that they have, but they got a piece of special legislation passed in 2005. And that special legislation explicitly states that the powers that they have given themselves as the legislative delegation under the 60, 61, 67, 76 acts are now devolved to Richland County. And so this organization, as I alluded to earlier, brought a case called Ray Davis versus Richland County in which that authorization was invalidated. Didn't make the county council all that happen. And actually, in the following year, they passed some legislation that I covered looking through this, uh, preparing this discussion, that now requires you to actually submit their budget to the county council, um, which is also invalid and should otherwise be challenged. So, um, any questions on that general point? What's the last thing you said about submitting the budget? Uh, we'll, show, we'll talk about it here. So. All right. Um, to the discussion in your boundary. So you can see this is really old legislation. So, like, that's what you have in your packet. I tried to just took a, take a screenshot about the way things operate. This is the authorization for where you are authorized to provide services. So, as the district, this operation of the district includes all areas in Richmond County, not embraced by the city of Columbia. So, what happens is the city of Columbia annexes the property out. Um, as they you know, continue to grow their boundaries, they're levying taxes for all of their general government functions. Well, as they annex property, they're basically eating into your service territory. Now, another question that also comes up, you know, 
city of Columbia is not the only city operating in, in Richmond County. Um, you got Fort Baker, you got Arcadia Lakes. All of them have the authorization to do recreation. So it creates a question as to what happens with your responsibility about recreation if you have, you know, you have facilities that are in incorporated municipalities. What, what is the responsibility? There, that's an open question. Um, something that, you know, we can do by government agreement. There are ways to work through that. You probably want to memorialize those relationships where you're operating within a city to make sure that they indeed agree for you to have facilities to operate. At. Historically, you've done it, so I don't think a lot of people are going to call the question. But that's what happens. And so you got to start thinking through how that service territory falls. And the reason that's important is because remember, the way that this organization operates is you levy taxes. You don't put a fee, you don't really, you charge minimal fees for use of some of your facilities, but the lion's share of the revenue you use to operate this organization come from taxes. And so if you lose service territory when someone annexes into your service area, that reduces your tax boundaries, which means it reduces your ability to levy taxes in that area. So that's an important consideration for you as you get in. Just boot the ball. Okay. So we talked about a second ago. You only have those powers because you're a Dillon Jewel institution. You only have those powers that are expressly granted to you by your name legislation. So this original name legislation, the 60 Act, and those 16 various amendments, and then whatever you also received by general law. And this is basically, I hate to summarize it in a short form, but this is basically the snapshot of what your power is. And so you have the ability to sue and be sued. Obviously, you have the ability to, to, to protect your rights. Um, you can define a quorum, although that's probably been preempted by the terms of FOIA, which say that a quorum is a, a, a relative majority of the constituent membership of the organization. Um, you have to uh, adopt a corporate seal, which obviously you all have the ability to do so. Um, you can acquire, acquire property, yet purchase or eminent domain to establish your education or recreation facilities. We'll get back to this one in a second because it's an important consideration. You can extend money for corporate functions. You can acquire and operate apparatus and equipment. Uh, you can prescribe rules and regulations, which we'll talk about some of those things that you need to adopt. You can fix rates and charges, so you can actually you know, set charges and pay, pay fees for facilities that you need. You can enter into companies and uh, employ agents, so that's the reason you can hire your executive staff. And you can issue debt to be able to connect those facilities. You'll notice in this original authorization, this is your 1950 authorization, you didn't have the ability to let it down. So that had to come in as a subsequent act that we'll talk about here in a second. But an important one is see here, and this is where you know, people say, well, lawyers just screw everything up. <laughs> they screw everything up. Um, you have the ability to acquire property, but what you don't have is the ability to sell property. And it's a don't rule entity. If you don't have it, you are not granted the power by legislature, you don't actually have that power. So there may be excess assets of this organization. We talked about that. There may be excess uh, assets in this organization that if you wanted to get rid of them, you can. Um, and so we've actually talked about with staff the potential of working with the special purpose district association to have them pass a piece of special legislation, or excuse me, pass a piece of general legislation in the special purpose district acts, which we'll talk about here in a second. Fire property, the ability to also sell property. Because it makes absolutely no sense that as you acquire assets through time, if you decided to build a new uh, executive suite on the on the, the piece of property that's the, over, you know, the, the, the kidney dial to the spot that's beside it, you can't get rid of the former spot. So you're going to sit there and have a an old facility that you can't get rid of. And that just doesn't make any sense. And I think there's probably an argument you had. So I saw Mayor Bob on there. This is this is a this is a discussion for Mayor Bob to start walk, walking through with the, uh, his contact with us. So I think it was recognized at some point in the process. Wow, we have this big organization that has the ability to provide recreation services in Richland County, but it doesn't have the independent authorization or ability to tax. And so what happened was in 1965, five years after you were created. It gave you the authorization to levy 0.5 million, um, which is not a whole lot of taxing authorization. As, as y'all may remember, millage is the way values the property of the community. 
to be able to determine what you want to have. So you could levy up to half a mil against all taxable property in your service territory um, and use that as the revenue stock. And then they must realize a few years later, oh, half a mil isn't going to do it. We have other facilities that move to a mil and a half. Then 69, they moved it to five mil. Now you'll see here the important consideration of it. I didn't actually quote the language. You can go to Act 317 of 69 in the packet. And it says the commission shall be authorized uh, to levy not exceeding five mils for the purposes of operating and maintaining the operations of the district. Sounds fairly innocuous to me, a fairly straightforward authorization. Um, but our good friend, Mr. Weaver, um, who y'all are probably familiar with because he, we've seen him recently, sued the district. And you actually created probably the seminal case for special purpose district all over the state in 97 saying that the delegation of taxing authority to an appointed board is an unconstitutional delegation of the populate but by, by people at large you're appointed to a political appointment and so you don't have the authorization independently to approve taxes so the court said even though that legislation was put in place in 60 and 69 it wasn't a home rule question as to whether or not it's unconstitutional it was an Impermissible delegation of legislative function to an unelected board, and they invalidated it. And so in 1998, when this decision came out, in 97, when the decision came out, they basically, if you read the opinion, the court says, this is invalid, but we recognize that this is going to create lots of problems for that 800 some odd special purpose districts that operate in South Carolina. Legislature, you need to fix this problem. So the legislature, in its consensualism, passed. Act 611 271, and they basically said, okay, we're just going to cap um, the special purpose district at whatever level they were they were levying prior to this being this being ruled in that. So in your in your and they just slotted you in at the five mil levy that you had then. But I had a couple of other clients like I don't I don't think they have any problems with this it's public. The Hilton had a special purpose. Uh, Hilton had number one special purpose district down in, in Hilton. That is one I call. They had this exact same language in their native legislation and said you can levy up to 10 mils. Well, at the time, they were only levying three. So they basically, as a result of the Weaver case and the legislation, they you know, historically had the ability to go up to 10, thought they were being good stewards of their taxpayer dollars. And this is now invalidated their new cap. Because of the Weaver, legislation, the Weaver litigation is now free. So they can't go over free. Um, and so, you know, they have the ability to operate because they charge the water sewer rate. But it was nice to have a tax levy to help support some other growth areas, especially for ancestral islanders, you know, folks that, that had been on Hilton had a lot longer than the multi million dollar home. Um, and so that's, you know, that's obviously an issue that folks need to deal with. Um, this, this, this act was more recently challenged. And he kind of got laughed out of court. Um, if you actually read the opinion, the court basically says, you challenged it, you had a valid argument, whether or not you think it was valid or not. I mean, my, my soapbox here is, is that the legislature gave you the ability to levy up to five mils. That is a cap limit. If they just said you got the ability to tax, yeah, that may be a problem. But they gave you a, a statutory cap. I don't think that's an over delegation. But be that as it may, that's the law for me. He sued you most recently, basically saying, Oh, yeah, this same legislation that the legislature passed to fix the problem, that's also in that. And <laughs> just try, try to get that to stop and also try to get this the, the bypass authorization where the county now approved your budget because there's two ways to bypass the statutory 1998 cap that applies to every special purpose district. And this is a piece of general, uh, general law. You can either have a referendum, you bypass your statutory cap from 1998. <clears throat> or you can go to the county council every single year, and the county council, as the elected body operating in your community, take the path of going to county council every single year to have them approve your budget. Um, the one way you could obviously get around that is if you were to hold a special referendum, where you submitted the question to your voters and said, "We're legally capped at five years. Now you're not operating at five years right now. You're Thirteen point five. So that means that the legislature, if the, the the county decided tomorrow we don't want to approve you at thirteen point five, we need to fall back to five. Um, 
that would be catastrophic for this organization. Um, there are like potentially a few workarounds for that, but it's not something I think we want to otherwise fight for. So it, it brings up the conversation of whether or not you know, further discussion needs to be evolved around how we advance this organization forward and, and start to have some independent authorization. Because if the let if the taxpaying public by referendum approves a new village cap. You can go up to that number and it doesn't, don't have that county council oversight or approval. That being said, in preparing for this discussion, 31 of 2006, this is the tax code. And I don't, I think that this was a piece of spite legislation, is basically the only way I can think of it, is that when they got mad that you invalidated their authorization to appoint people's board members, they said, all right, well, now you always have to come back to us and get our, your budget approved to the county council. So they passed this deep special legislation that says the governing body of the recreation commission, um, where they levy taxes, has to come and that authorization to approve that can only be vested through county council. Now, that's that's the way state law works with respect to debt. But with operating budget, that's not the case. So, this is absolutely and unequivocally an unconstitutional piece of legislation. But as I said before, it's valid until it's otherwise challenged. So it leaves us two, two results. We probably either need to get a piece of legislation passed abolishing or terminating this, or we're going to have to bring a DJ action to it out. And it's, again, there's not many absolutes in the practice of law, but I can say unequivocally that this is unconstitutional and it should be overturned. That would be to, to invalidate something that we know is unconstitutional. Hopefully, we can get the legislature to <coughs> simply pass a piece of legislation. To promote that. So, conversation that probably will continue to evolve um, as we move forward. Any questions on that? All right. Okay. So, we've gotten through your special legislation. As I alluded to earlier, you can only, you know, outside of now not being able to pass legislation affecting a single county. You now have to pass general laws or general laws that are already on the book affecting local government in general apply to you. So, what's the perfect example of that? FOIA. Y'all are obviously subject to FOIA as a, as a special purpose of a local government body. But, you know, the idea of how you hold meetings, and we'll talk about that in a little while as well, or how you produce public records if you're obviously going to be directly responsible for the State Ethics Act, how, how you report ethical violations or how you operate as an organization. Same thing with executive staff, same thing with members. Yeah, um, and obviously, the state constitutional provisions would obviously apply as well. So, I did actually just pull together kind of a list of general uh, legislation that affects you. So, one, one of the ones that's probably important and I'll recognize is um, it's the only requirement you have to actually hold a public hearing, uh, it's the adoption of your annual budget. So, 6 1. Uh, 6 1 80 requires you to run a notice in the newspaper and let anyone that wants to come in and talk about your budget see it, receive it, and then count it. The problem with that is, is that approving your budget because of that tax issue, you still got to go back to county council and have them balance it. So, one of those questions that I always have wrestled with is you got to go back to county council, and like last year, county council cut your budget by a million some odd dollars. You then have to go back and do a subsequent budget authorization to your budget. So, you know, those, those are the types of things that we just don't have in. Um, political investments. So, money that you have, uh, you know, cash reserves in the organization, you, if there is express prohibition on investments in equity. So, there is a statute directly on point that basically limits the potential risk associated with the investment of public funds. Um, and so, one of the places you can always park money is with the, the local government investment pool administered by the state treasurer. It probably is one of the best spots to, to park cash. And I think Randy, you've now done a fair amount of that, um, or at least had the conversation. Yeah, about it. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and done it yet. But to the extent you have cash and your limitations are, you can basically put money in a U.S. treasury, but the 10 year treasury is still under 1%. I think at one point earlier this year, Close to zero, you aren't making a whole bunch of money on the money pool. The low government investment pool is probably as clean and efficient place to do it. You can get your money quickly, and it's fair to say. Um, authorization for fees so, there's authorization by state law to put on development impact fees. 
I don't know any special purpose districts that do this outside of the water sewer context. Uh, but the basic idea behind that is, is that as developers move into your community, they build, you know, a developer comes in and they build a you know, mixed use uh, development, they put in a thousand apartments and they put in um, you know, new assets, they're going to be sort of, you know, a burden on the existing ancestral taxpayers that paid the assets here when they're getting the benefit of. So that's the idea of putting on a fee to basically recuperate the impact of, of the, the, the burden that they're putting on the system. It may make sense in the recreation context, it's typically done mostly in water and sewer. Um, some other, if they go up into the Rock Hill area, the school would actually start putting on their challenges while uh, they're going on around what those direct impacts are on school. Um, basically, the catch all is um, in Title VI, Chapter 11. So, so now that every special purpose district can't have particular laws passed in their counties, the legislature just has this kind of grab bag, and when they pass, So that's, you kind of have to kind of look back through the legislative history to see when changes occur as to whether or not it's effective. But there is a decor authorization in Title VI, Chapter 11, as to how you would potentially expand or contract your boundaries that's done by the county, um, as to um, how you levy uh, certain particular fees, and ultimately how you would dissolve it. It's, it's prohibitively difficult to dissolve a special purpose district once they're created. That's actually been part of the rub as well. In order to do so, you have to get a petition signed by, um, I believe it's 15% of the qualified electorate just to put it on, on the ballot, which in Richmond County, when you've got several hundred thousand people, you have to get a petition signed by 30 or 40,000 people just to put it on the, on the ballot, and then it has to pass by a super majority. Um, so the idea of voting you out of existence is pretty much Never, ever, ever going to happen. And because, and so absent the legislature passing, we can make all special purpose to come out of the woodwork, they can't dissolve you by special legislation. The legislature actually tried to do that with, with respect to um, the Richland County uh, Historical Foundation. And they, they took their authorization, and they basically diluted it down the side of the postage stamp. Their assets in Gaming County. So, no, you can't do that because only one way to dissolve special purpose is through that, um, which is, as I said, is a really hard way to do it. So, it's, it's this really weird dynamic that you have as a special purpose district where you, you were created, you're operating under powers that you received 60 years ago. You can't change those powers unless you pass special laws. And then you're seen as a burden to you know, the efficiency of government in certain areas, and certain people. But you can't do anything about you because you can't get rid of it. So you you fall in this really weird kind of no man's land, and that's the reason I, like I said, you all are kind of the redheaded stepchild of, of local government. You perform a necessary service. Recreation is a vital. Be able to get outside and exercise and, and, and not be stuck in your house is is, is vital to the kind of public health of anything. Um, but there are some limitations that we all have to work on. So that's just kind of a list of, of, of general laws that also affect Okay, so we're sort of putting in some language in here, and you'll see that my kind of discussion generally follows the way that your your end of um, follows, but just to also hit a couple of things. So something to think about as a member of uh, of this board, as well as the executive staff. There's a constitutional prohibition on what's called dual office holding. So it's the idea of holding two, two offices of honor and profit. So you, believe it or not, this is a position of honor and profit. It's, it may not be profit, but certainly honor. Um, and as a result, yeah, uh, yeah you, your, your actual organization uh, does, not, does not allow you to receive compensation, although there is a Got called in tomorrow, or you ran for the legislature and you, you ran for one of those seats, that would be any one. And so you became a senator, you couldn't serve on both this board and, and, and that board. And so there are lots of AG opinions out there about how that honor and profit kind of motivation is there. So, you know, there are, there are things that you know, happen all the time. If you're on the election commission, you can't be on, on this board, or if you're a 
point is, it's even better to be on the penny sales tax commission. You can't be on this board. So it's just something to make sure you're aware of because if you do accept a position that's considered another position of honor profit, you are deemed to have automatically um, resigned your position of the former board, um, which then creates issues because then you got to go back to the process of getting it. So I'll point that out just so that y'all are generally aware of what that. Okay, so now we kind of get into the meat and potatoes of what it is to be a commission. And so that's this idea of what, what is your role as the governing body of this organization? It's hard for some board members to realize where that line is. And so you know, if you've never had board training or discussions about what that is, you know, there's no there's no particular right line. No, no one gave you a packet when you stepped in and said, hey, this is what you are as a special purpose or these are your powers, and this is what your role is as a commission. At some level, you just kind of had to work your way through it. But historically speaking, we look back to what your nation legislation says. It says, you know, previously you have the ability to implement rules and regulations to uh, employ executive staff to make decisions about the operation of the organization. And so at that level, the way that I typically describe this to the cities that I represent, the counties that I represent, is that if you are a city council or a county council or a governing board of a special purpose district, you don't get involved in the day-to-day -day operations of, of, this, of this organization. What you do is you, you are the big picture. People. You set policy. That policy then becomes the law. You know, you, You make decisions on is the, the decisions on how you operate as an organization. And so that doesn't mean we make decisions about you know what the hours of a particular facility are, but you may make decisions that you know we want to close this facility because it doesn't make long-term sense in our long-term budget operation. Or we need to make sure that we have a FOIA policy, or that we have a procurement policy, or that we have bylaws for how the organization otherwise then you make decisions absolutely about who you hire to fill the role. Of the executive director. But what you don't have is the ability to then call into question the decision that she makes, other than the conversation beyond you know, her, her annual review as to who her, her staff member, because that is an, an essentially executive director function that she has been hired by this board to make decisions as to how you operate and implement policies that you all set. So, good conversations for us and our executive director are involved. What our vision and mission are, yes, and how to balance conversations with involve who works where and the hours of the facility. Absolutely, the, the, those decisions are inherently operational. So that is the break point here. You're, you're the big picture. You are setting policy. You are making organizational decisions about how the facility is ultimately going to be structured. Now, at the end of the day, you ultimately approve the budget. And so, if you said, "Look, if Lakia says I need a new facilities operator," at the, the tennis center at XYZ, and you say, well, we don't have money in the budget, yeah, you can, you can get there on the back of the next one because you can cut it out of the budget. If that doesn't make sense. But in theory, that would be considered a miss. Yeah, I think that's, that's probably an overstep of your function, unless there is a legitimate budgetary function for making that decision. But again, staff is also preparing that budget for you to make the big picture decisions as do. Now, does it make sense to put on a, a cost of living adjustment? Do we need to benchmark staff salaries to inflation? You know, do we need to make a decision as to whether or not this facility you know, operates three days a week or five days a week? But if it's not, if it doesn't make sense to be in an area that four people a month show up to, it probably doesn't make sense to make that facility stay operational. And so not everyone so, will close inbound. Yeah, but, but you got you the know, details of that of the actual function of that being open or how how the facility be maintained to close. That's the executive director and her delegated staff. Correct. But sometimes you have to get into the the four you know the four people a week that show up at the park. Right. Is causing it not to be profitable. Hence, our advice is to shut it down. So you do have to back in. That's right. You have, to, you have, you have, to, have to back into some of the minutia to make the decision. And some of that should be ultimately delivered to you through executive staff. At the end of the day, the reason that you hire an executive right. director is yeah. to give you that information to ultimately make the decision 
as to how you decide you want to make a decision. That's the reason that you're appointed here is to make a decision on how that facility functions. And we got to make a decision or have a conversation and have a decision whether that facility is open or closed. Correct. That's definitely that correct. You were responsible for the management of the asset. So, and then again, that comes back to the how, when, and where of issue. These are the big picture ideas about, you know, what power you give to your power. What are the decision-making thresholds with respect to your Because that's probably the important one that is otherwise out there, is the idea of what are the, what are the breakpoints behind, you know, where you feel comfortable with the staff making purchases. So that needs to be laid out in policy. And right now, there's not really clear defined terms on what that policy would be. Um, and so one of the things that's in your packet today, and we're about to get up and talk about it, is the provisions that we generally that we generally put forth as a draft policy for procurement. Because state law, there is, you know, obviously everyone recognizes the state has a procurement code. There are you know, cooperative purchasing obligations, the state local government, so cities, counties, some school districts, and special purpose districts. State law says. You only have to adopt a policy affecting um, appropriately competitive procurement, which means you don't have to follow the state procurement. Code. You just have to have a policy that you've implemented that implements and authorizes purchases to ultimately be made at certain threshold. Well, that needs to be sufficient, you know, significantly rewritten. A draft of that has been done. The question is, is if you approve something in the budget and you need to put in a new slide apart. If that's a $5,000 that's probably not something that needs to come in front of this board and make decisions. But if it's a $500,000 that probably is. And so it's a matter of defining what you think is material with respect to budget. Do we have that, a number for that? Yeah, well, so there's is there a threshold number. Like there is. Sarah, so, so do you want to you jump into this discussion on security real quick? We'll come back to these in a second. But these are general. So that my, my next step before we get to that was to then think about it. These are some of the things that are as a, as a board function, I would absolutely and unequivocally recommend that you don't already have in place or you haven't revisited this, this board came into effect. These are the big picture items that need to be addressed. And so obviously the budget is done every year. FOIA is something that gets administered every single day. There's actually a draft FOIA policy, and we'll talk about what that looks like here in a second, because on the second half of my presentation. Going to be talking about um, about what, um, but HR and employment. Obviously, that's as as vital to the organization because, frankly, one of the major hurdles that y'all had is, is, is the issues with staff and staff litigation. How do you deal with that? Uh, you have a full time labor employment lawyer as your as your local counsel um, to be able to do that. So that process. Conflict of interest. We've actually implemented kind of a general conflict of interest policy in your procurement. Procurement that Sarah's going to talk about whistleblowers. If someone says, you know what, I'm being sexually harassed and it's being it's my direct boss, um, what is the, what is the policy internally for how that happens? Because believe you, if that's all the way, otherwise not in place. Red flag is about how you administer public funds, receive information about social security numbers. Bible, those are obviously important because right now, the bylaws that you have in place, what is the rules of procedure that you follow for holding a board? You follow our rules, but you kind of default to that. But if you don't state it, you have to say that that's what your bylaws follow. You're just kind of out there floating the wind. So figuring out what some of those authorizations are, we've suggested some fairly significant provisions to your bylaws, and also in packet uh, that you have in front of you today. Operating regulations, things that you want to talk about about the facilities, how they're going to operate, um, what those hours of operation may ultimately be, what staff salaries or you know what's, what staffing requirements may ultimately need to come through. If there are large big picture discussions that need to happen, that's where you would set that as policy. Capital planning, that's going to be part of the discussion on Monday, thinking through what the capital plan looks like for facilities that need to happen. You know, the it's it's it seems now it's one thing to operate that budget or to adopt that budget every year, but until you've done kind of a thorough review of all the facilities that you have. You know, when you've got, you know, how many facilities do you have under man? A little 40. So you have, 40, you have 40 facilities. And so that means that you have 40 light bills, and 40 water bills, and 40 sewer bills, and 40 roofs that need to be able to 
40, 40 buildings that may otherwise need to be painted. And you don't have a capital plan that looks at all of those facilities and says, we need to replace a roof every single year. Well, roofs have a 30 year useful life on them, give or take. Maybe it has a longer useful life. I'm sure there are roofs out there that, that have a 60 year, you know, they're 60 years old, but they're not going to replace the year old that they created. But thinking through those things and then matching that up with your operating budget and your long term capital budget is the discussion that, that Brandy is going to start having with you on, on, on Monday. Because that, in and of itself, we could do an entire work session just around the capital. Budget, budget, because you know, tomorrow this roof could start leaking, you know, the HVAC unit could otherwise go bad. You know, and all of a sudden you start talking about placing 40 HVAC units at ten thousand dollars a pop or you know, twenty thousand dollars pop, that's a million bucks. And that's you know, where's that million dollars gonna come from? And so thinking strategically through not only capital maintenance, but new capital facilities, because there may be some of those facilities that are not worth continuing to pump money into the HVAC system. That's so inefficient, or you have for, for the core community, you know, uh, retention. All of that needs to start being built into a capital plan that is probably looked at on a five, ten, and maybe even longer period, wrapping that around the plans for long term debt, which right now we've got some limitations on what we can borrow by way of new term obligation debt, new long term capital, and also identifying funds in your operating budget to do pay go capital, um, as opposed to. Just kind of doing it all along as things otherwise come up. And that's not to say that things don't happen, but that you should also probably have some depreciation. It pop up, you know, out of, out of, out of, out of the ordinary especially that you don't have a lot of discussion. So, with that, I'm going to give it to Sarah to just kind of generally talk through the proposed bylaws, the proposed procurement code, the proposed FOIA policy, as well as the uh, um, and so I know there were some questions specifically about procurement, but I think it's best we start with bylaws. If you could think of, you know, I think there's the Russian nesting dolls, or it's the big doll, and you open up your little dolls and small, small, small. Your big doll in this is going to be your bylaws. Um, your bylaws, your overarching stuff, everything from as Lawrence mentioned, how you run meetings to the Obligations which Lakita can enter the district into. Um, the bylaws are kind of the overarching thing. And so, do have a current set of bylaws? They were enacted in 2017. And in looking at them and reviewing them, we saw some areas for improvement. Um, for example, the ethics, the ethics law, which all are governed by, it referenced like a national recreation district kind of policy. Um, which for all intents and purposes might be fine, but definitely best practice to reference what you're actually governed by. You know, no one from the National Recreation Association is going to come in and plus y'all for doing something wrong, but if you violate the state ethics policy, you're going to be in trouble there. So um, best to duck deal with that. And so, as I mentioned, this is our largest nesting doll. So in drafting these bylaws, we make sure that they are read they can be read in tandem with the procurement policy and PCAR policy. Um, we have spent a lot of time with staff, with Lakita, with Brandy, Cicely, Tamika, everybody. We spent a lot of time with these, making sure that they can all be read together. There's nothing contradictory. Because what you don't want to have happen is to say, oh, well, I was following the procurement code when I did this transaction, and I mean, it was fine. And then you look at your bylaws and you say, eh. Well, actually, this is contradictory to our bylaws. You know, that just creates a whole host of problems together. Which is an important consideration. But remember, the reason behind implementing policy is to give staff direction as to how they implement. The biggest problem with some with over, you know, with over implementing policy is that if you put something in place and said this is the way we're going to do something, and then you ignore it or disregard it or don't follow it, where you have competing provisions. And someone challenges you on it, you create a roadmap and you are dead in the water because you have to follow your core framework. So that's it's a lot of times the policy is going to be written around things that we know you're already doing. We're memorializing it to be able to give you that roadmap in case someone doesn't. Um, and as Lauren said, this is your framework. So the bylaws enable Lakita to execute payments and sign checks up to five thousand dollars. And to otherwise obligate the district up to $100,000. And so that obligation would be 
you know, entering into leases, contracts, those sort of things. Um, and that's what the bylaws authorize. The procurement code kind of sets the framework of, okay, how does the Kia get to a point where she's ready to execute a check for $5,000? The Kia can't just go to Target and buy some for $5,000. The procurement code sets out the exact steps to get to a point where she's comfortable, the district's ready to, extra, to execute that $5,000 check. Same with the $100,000 obligations. So know that when you are reviewing the bylaws and approve the bylaws, the bylaws are read in tandem with the procurement code. So the procurement code, you need to make sure you're comfortable with the procurement code because as I said, the procurement code gets to the point where the $5,000 check is executed. Um, the bylaws also set forth how to approach conflicts. Um, this goes to the ethics portion here. Um, commissioners cannot be entering into contracts that benefit themselves or immediate family members. Um, they also can't be gaining, they can't be associated with the corporation that's going to get an economic gain from the contract. Um, and so there's a policy laid out in the bylaws of what to do if you are an interested policy. You have to make a written statement, you have to, it has to be read in some minutes, and you have to refuse yourself from the decision making process. You don't actually have to leave the room, but you can't, you have to be silent, you can't participate in the back and forth of the decision making. Um, Which is an important consideration, and we'll talk about it a little bit with respect to FOIA. But if, you, if state law requires that from an ethical standpoint for you to disclose an ethical violation, as you said, you do it in writing, you submit it to the, to the keeper of the minutes, and you can stay in the room. But you're then disqualified for purposes of becoming court. So that, that's an issue. So if you know, you've got five members of your board, and you're required to have seven for purposes of being able to do business in quorum. Is ultimately required to be four. So if four of you happen to show up to a meeting and one of you got disqualified for a conflict of interest, you all of a sudden no longer have four of you. Contracts have been invalidated on that point. That's really something to keep in mind. Do you pay attention to your agendas when they come out and be thinking, all right, do I have a conflict in this point? And also, even if you don't have a direct economic interest in it, if you perform an official function related to the contract, so let's say that you work for the company for some contract to be entered into, and you don't get a pay bump because of it, but you work for that company and you would otherwise sign the contract. Well, you can't participate. You can recuse yourself, and the district can still enter into that contract so long as you are an arm's length. You can't have any involvement with it. You have to be specifically... Chinese wall away from that. So that's another thing to keep in mind. You know, your relation to different people, you know, could you anyway otherwise be involved with the actual contract? So just to put that in perspective, if you actually had the ability to sell property, you could hire Rob's firm to list that facility. But Rob couldn't vote on it if he was having a direct interest in the result. So but, yeah, if I was a partner in that if you were a partner in the firm and you actually wrote We're not responsible for drafting the bid specifications for how the public procurement of that facility. So if you if you put it out to the market, you said, well, we're going to let Trinity, you know, Trinity bids on it, and NAI bids on it, and Collier bids on it, and you happen to be the low bid, that doesn't disqualify you because you're the chairman of the board. As long as it was done in the open, you didn't vote on it, and it was done based on good faith procurement, that is still okay to be done. The key to it is, is that you weren't responsible for drafting the bid specs. For Putting that out the solicitation. Well, don't you want? Don't you want to avoid the the so, appearance of that? So at least it's a really good point. Yeah. Sometimes the appearance of impropriety is just as bad as the actual impropriety. Right. So right. that is an internal decision as to how you would ultimately yeah. want to treat that situation. <laughs> you may just say, "Look, we're disqualifying ourselves because we don't need we don't yeah, need the yeah. political blowback of you know of the newspaper running articles saying that." Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Exactly. Very good point. Um, so now we get into the purchasing and procurement. I think this is tab C in your um, handout. And this sets the framework for procuring goods, services, contracts. Like I said, it gets you to that point where you're ready to execute the contracts. Um, there's some point, important exceptions to the procurement code professional services, such as attorneys, accountants, engineers. 
We are disciplined with procurement code. Um, fault behind this being you don't want to go cheap on your account. You don't want to go cheap on your attorney. Right. Um, and cheap. also, there's you know you've got an established relationship with technology. For example, they're another firm that's exempted. I'm very impressed with y'all's technology. <laughs> <laughs> and y'all don't want to just give out the next contract to some technology firm because they were the lowest bidder, and then all of a sudden their stuff isn't compatible with y'all's and. Before you know it, they want y'all throwing out all of your technology and buying new technology that works with theirs. It just creates, you know, having that foundational base with qualified professionals is worth something. And for those reasons, it's exempted from the procurement code. Um, subject to y'all's approval, when you get to those thresholds, the actual process of how you hire some how you hire someone is not subject to the processes of the procurement code. Um, we've also built in some really state-of-the-art flexibility that allow y'all to be lean and agile with the way y'all go about your projects. Um, there is a design, bid, construct process, which with y'all's approval, the district can enter into. And so this means rather than having to go out and bid for every single step of, you know, a new baseball facility, y'all can pick one person to design it and then sub out the bids for the contract and you do it kind of in an overarching comprehensive plan rather than having to break up every single contract and bid out every single contract then you've got people that have never worked with people and this that and the other helps continuity when you have those larger projects um and that's not unique to you that that is actually the, the uh, alternative delivery system that is recognized by the state you can generally follow the state procurement code on alternative delivery in the deployment of local government services. So unfortunately, fortunately or unfortunately, typically when you put something out to bid, people bid on it because they know you're going to pay. But they also think that because you've got tax dollars behind you, they don't give you a whole lot of discount. So know, knowing that you're able to go out and get the lowest cost services because someone helps you do it. Very well. So I, I worked on this kind of stuff with much smaller scale with um, Design and building weight rooms. Yeah. One of the hard things for me is that whenever I go to a, a company and I'm like, hey, I want to build this weight room, and they give me specs that are going to be specific, they're they give me specs not just for me, but with the way that they build their equipment and their functionality. Exactly. It's difficult for me to be like, okay, thank you, company A, for giving me all the specs and all that stuff here, and spending more time and effort and all that. And then I'm going to go to company B and award the bid when they're actually. A lot of times they're not going to give you the exact same specs. They say they will, mm -hmm. but I end up with a different product. And, and uh, so that, that gets back inherently. So if, you, if you've gone out there and you've done the diligence on the front end, you say, you know, we want pre-core equipment here. We want this particular version of weights. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the bids come back and one person is dead on your bid uh, specs and the other person offers a competitor that is not what you've otherwise requested, that's an invalidating condition by the terms of your bid. So the key is you got to make sure you follow the provisions of your bid. In other words, that might say anything bad about one piece of equipment or other, but if you spec out Cybex in pre-quarter, but Cybex is the industry leader, right. and it's a little bit more expensive, you can take it based on quality. Correct. So long as you put it out in your original bid frame, you didn't. You said when you did not designate. If you said we want a high quality said, rowing okay. machine, and they and they put it in, and you don't say we want a Cybex rowing machine. We, if you just say we want a high quality rowing machine, then that's not an invalidated condition. You've got to make sure specific in your bid specifications as to what you want, because then that then becomes a ground for challenge through the skill process that you've laid out. And I would say two things on that. First is in these alternative projects, you know, alternative processes. Sounds like what you're getting to, Coach. Instead of having to fit out the design, fit out the construction, fit out the you know weights that would go in there, what you could do is enter into this alternative process with approval of the commission, and then you say, you know what, we want to hire one person to design it and build it. We get design build. Yes, and so you would do a design build, so it would be one person. That Holistically doing the whole thing, you don't have the issue of like, oh, they did the specs, but now we put these late sheets in here to unfit. And so we, that would be a design build situation. Well, I think the other hard part is like when you don't have a bid, there's a certain lack of accountability and transparency. Mm -hmm. So it's not like I'm, I just wonder, I don't know, I just wonder how. It's like going to 
Sornax or William Strang would say, hey, you know what, you know, industry leader would say Sornax, and you're very, I guess you could have the, you could have, you could hire them to be your design builder with commission's approval. Is that correct? That's, That's correct. Great. So there's a there's a function that allows us to pay a company to design build yes. and then still sub out the you know, rest of the yeah I mean it, 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 there is authorization to do design that they'll operate mm -hmm. contain design build all, all of the various methodologies are now built into the draft procurement code to give you that flexibility what what historically happened in local government procurement was most folks all we're local government you've got to take low bid right that has evolved through time because we've realized through time, that taking the lowest bidder is not the most efficient or cost effective way to do business. So, having relationships, having good specifications to meet particular needs of the people, because if you know one of them has, you know, it's the, it's the industry leader and it's got a 30 year useful life, mm -hmm. and everything else that has a 15 year or a guarantee or some, you know, a, a essential backstop, there's real value in that that may not be tangible. How you put a finger on, but the idea of not having to go and add that to your capital plan where you got to replace that in 15 years and it's a 30 year fix, mm -hmm. there, it, it, it helps itself. Mm -hmm. And I would say also, um, it's the, I think it's the third page of the procurement policy. I really encourage you to read the, and don't quote me now, I mean, you might be like, there's two people somewhere in there. <laughs> um, there's a definition of lowest qualified bidder. And lowest qualified bidder includes a price. Consideration, but it also has lots of other points in there of what makes someone the lowest qualified bidder. You know, you're not just going to hand it to Joe Blow contracting firm because they gave you the lowest bid. If you start looking at them, you say, Wait, you've never built a basketball court before, you've never done this before, you're not qualified to do this. You know, it prevents the district's hands from being bound to just always choosing that lowest price bidder, as Lawrence was just saying. So everything throughout the procurement code, you'll notice we never say the lowest bidder. We always say the lowest qualified bidder because that's a term of art which we work projects and people that aren't qualified to undertake them. So I'm digressing, but yeah. is this like I think it's tab D, it's the procurement. Yes. Gives one D, but you put here, is that what y'all proposing to become our new policy or just work? That's what we're proposing to become a new policy. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, so what we would say is, obviously, there's, the discussion today was to build the discussion around, let's have a conversation that policies are needed. Here are some draft policies, but obviously not expecting help to make any, any decisions about how we go. But the, the thought would be, read them, review them, and I do think that staff would like to have some action taken on them. Not in February, but at some point here in the spring, because we, we really do need to have some of these directions from the commission as to how you want to do it. And so these are suggestions. You know, the purchase thresholds are things that we think operationally made sense. And we know you're getting it cold today. So the main thing, if we needed to do another work session where you actually review these policies and say, let's talk about why you put a hundred thousand dollar cap as the as the number to come back in front of the commission, we think that needs to be 250 because you know a play, you know, a piece of playground equipment that calls to this, whatever it is. Right. Those are those are decisions that you know, nothing, none of this is set in stone. This is the opportunity to start having that conversation. And staff is very familiar with all these purchase thresholds because they were, you know, I will say in, in, in Sicily, your procurement manager, she comes from a very militarized background. Um, is very diligent about making sure that she, 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 she cracks the purchase threshold, but she can leave tomorrow and the next person that comes through it may be a little bit more freewheeling. And so we want to make sure that we've got the parameters to be able to give that direction. And so that's what, that's what this discussion is all about. Mr. Chairman, what I'd like to add is, if you were, if you were recall uh, during the audit that was done, the management audit that was done in 2016, 17, prior to me arriving and the appointment, the need for the commission to review the procurement policy, as well as incorporate training for all staff that are involved in the processes. So we have definitely been moving forward and working as legal, in doing everything we're supposed to do, but if you also go backwards to the resolution that was passed uh, for the golf carts, 
That's why the resolution came to you all because of that large amount that was requested for that purchase. And that's not having a clear direction in our procurement or in the bylaw. So um, this is for us to look at and review, but we would love to have a separate work session if you have additional questions so that we can get this passed so that I am operating consistently between the bylaws and the procurement policy as well as my staff. Thank you. Um, and then just the last thing I'd point out, the procurement gives preference to vendors who are minorities, um, veterans, women, and um, local vendors. We define what it takes to become one of those. Um, and then the, there's preference, which I think is a great thing. It's a 5% threshold. So basically they get to come in and beat the low bid. If, if they fall into one of those qualified categories, they can come in and beat the low bid. Mm -hmm. So I think we've really touched on a lot of this, but you know, y'all are exempt from the state procurement policies, um, but you are required to have a procurement code. So that's where this has come from, is that y'all you know, kind of run the show within your procurement code. So that's why it's necessary to have one of those. Um, so this is kind of into the nitty gritty. This is the threshold of kind of how staff will operate without you. And so as I mentioned, the um, $5,000 number that the PETA can execute a check on, how do we get there? So for purposes that are less than $2,500, um, those are approved by the procurement manager and the CFO. So those are going to be your smaller purchases, no need to do bids, those sort of things for that. When you get to $2,500 to $10,000, there have to be written solicitations. Um, speaking with staff, you know, this is kind of a squishy place where it's not a ton of money, so it's not a full bid process. People a lot of times aren't going to want to have to go through a bid process and write a bid to maybe make $5,000. So for this, we have it just you have to have a written solicitation of that. Um, and then when you get to the ten to twenty-five thousand dollar threshold, that's when you get into the competitive sealed bid process. There have to be, um, excuse me, this is just three written solicitations. This requires notice. We'll advertise for it on the district website, on the state websites. Um, so really putting the word out there, making sure people are interested in it, and you have to get three written solicitations. So when you get above $25,000 is when you get into the very strict sealed competitive bidding. And there's a whole policy for that in the procurement code, but it requires that. So when you're writing a bid and you put it out there, you're receiving these sealed bids, they're all opened at a certain time. If they're received late, they're disqualified. Um, so that's the higher you get, basically the harder it is. Within these thresholds, everything is still governed by that lowest qualified bidder. Receive three written solicitations from the ten to twenty-five thousand dollar range, or the written solicitations in the twenty-five hundred to ten thousand dollar range. They're always going to have in mind that lowest qualified bidder. And that's how they're going to do their decision process. But how they get to that decision process gets more difficult and more difficult. And anything beyond a hundred thousand dollars has to be formally approved by the commission. And as Lawrence mentioned, these are thresholds that we come up with and working with the district and having lots of conversations around how does stuff work? You know, what flexibility do y'all need? How do y'all need to function? Um, and through those conversations, we've come up with these numbers. However, if this is something that, as Lawrence mentioned, fell in a work session, if you want to talk about the nitty gritty of, all right, and why 25,000, why 10,000? We're happy to do that. These policies are in draft form. But this is what um, we've come up with when working with staff. Um, there's also a requirement of a disclosure of interest. We've kind of touched on this in bylaws, but it's also in your procurement code to make sure that of the commissioner with the interest to disclose it. It's not the obligation of the chair to, you know, have to be abreast of everybody's interest. You know, that's your obligation as a commissioner, and it's usually going to be a hot order if you don't do that. You know, that's not the responsibility of Lakita or the chair. You know, it's, you're the one that's going to take the blame for that. As, as we alluded to it earlier, you actually see in there, we, we cited a couple of cases. That Anderson County case actually is somewhat similar to the Richmond County case where they invalidated a gold parachute for the former county administrator. Um, in this circumstance, they, they basically made a determination that others, seven member of the county council, four members had a direct conflict of interest as a result of um, the relationship between the former administrator and the member of the council that voted to give him this million dollar severance, a um, million dollar revolving contract um, as a result of them serving the land session. And the court invalidated the contract 
Uh, because they basically said you were served, you, you voted on that, you had a conflict of interest, you disqualified for purposes of, of, of sitting at, at a qualified forum, uh, disqualifying you, only three of the seven members, or three of the nine members were, were otherwise authorized to vote on it, that invalidates the entire contract. And so, you know, if you're sitting in a position where you, know, you are approving contracts or you're approving a, a contract with a uh, director or staff, you want to make sure that you've done it validly because that is the protection that your contract has to give you. you know, if we were doing a bond issue and you know we were we were bidding on something that you know for, for some reason gave gave someone a conflict of interest. Um, you know, you owned the bank and your bank was the low bidder and you voted on it, that's gonna that's obviously gonna create some issues for us. And so, you know, I had to do a bond council opinion at the end of that authorization that says the contracts that you're signing are valid. Uh, validly authorized and executed. Well, if it wasn't validly authorized, it invalidated the entire bond. That's a problem. <laughs> so backing up to that, which kind of goes back into your policy here, let's just say you do a, a, a $200,000 contract with somebody. Who signs that contract? So the direct authorization in there, it, it, it depends. The, the thresholds are going to be what gives us out. But if you look back at the bylaws, as proposed, you said, you know, for items under $5,000, right. the executive director can. But once you get into a higher threshold, then it becomes a commissioner, board member of staff, where you have dual signature, a dual signature authority, so you don't have people that run all the That's contract. what I was going to say. So, like on the Richmond County issue, you know, the last administrator issue was a million dollar pipe. Whatever it was, I don't remember. Sure. It was a lot, and so they voted it, but then he got paid. So who would have written that check? Was it chairman of the commission or the council signed that check, or would it have been? And that would be whatever their practice was. I assume that their their treasurer, the county treasurer, would have signed the check. Probably signed the check. Problem with that is uh, that that contract is subsequently also been invalidated, right? But not for a disclosure of failure to disclose a conflict of interest, but on a, a FOIA related issue because they were determined to have voted to approve the contract in the next session. As we know, no action can be taken in the next session. So that then invalidated that entire contract. And so then you create the issue of, well, what does that mean for purposes of his contract? Does he then have a on a Maryland claim back in the county that holds it back in the litigation. So it's much cleaner to do this the correct way in the front end and keep you out of the litigation. Uh, hold the whole lot. So, um, again, files, procurement policy, and we have this purchasing part policy. And this is for the day to day stuff when staff, you know, when somebody needs something, they run out, they're buying it, they're buying t shirt, they're buying, you know, small purchases. Um, Staff, we've worked this week really hard. Um, there's been all gas, no breaks this week. And this is solid. Again, Sicily is awesome at this. I wish every client we work with had a procurement manager. It's Sicily would save us a lot of work in the back end. <laughs> we've a lot of stuff. Um, and Dan, you know, said this is how this works for us, this is how it doesn't. You know, she made sure that there's training. Everyone is going to be trained on the policy, the cardholder, the cardholder supervisor, the liaison, everybody's involved with this, and they should know what they can and cannot do with the car. There are specific purchases, and so, you know, you can't run out and go back, you can't get back, you can't go and get your hair cut because, you know, there are specific um, things that are prohibited, and then within the policy, you know, the process for going about when you do the car. So we have really cards here for me to hand out. Yes, yeah. Um, so the super, it's a supervisor and Sicily together. Um, if the supervisor deems the need for a card holder to have it, the supervisor will fill out an application. The application will then come to application. And then depending on the credit limit they will have, Sicily um, will either she can approve their credit limit because it's below a $2,500 credit limit. I think Randy was at 2500 that ended up on what we had approval for. Mm -hmm. And I think anything beyond, beond $2,500, but certainly it can be beyond $2,500, it has to go before Lupita or Brandy has to approve. Yeah. So, who is going to do the review of, let's say, employee X 
doesn't need to have a card in their name. Well, well, let me, because I want to share that because I always get some clarification. No one gets a card without me signing off. I would know everyone that has yeah, 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 a card. All right. Yes. Who, yes. Who, who has a card? Who is going to be reviewing that? Like, the supervisors along with the um, procurement staff. So every month they will take a look at that yes. bill and they say, quick grip. You won't get to, you don't get to use your card without a prior approval. Right. Yeah, so every purchase okay. requires an approval. So right. that approval has to match that purchase and it will be reconciled each month. Yeah, there's mm -hmm. a monthly reconciliation in there where we um confirm statement and provide receipt and justification that will be the justification is provided in the purchase. Yeah. And so they will every month take that monthly statement and say, All right, here is my receipt for this purchase, here is my Purchase order from this purchase that I had to fill out before that had my justification for our seats. When I did it, there's a lot of statement that matches that. So the employee is responsible for going through every single month and doing all their purchases. The employee then hands that to the, their supervisor. The supervisor signs off on it and then it goes to Sicily. And Sicily looks and says, do the third round. And if Sicily says, I, I don't know, this receipt doesn't quite match. Or your purchasing order said you were going to purchase this product, this product from you know X, and you actually purchased it from Y. Sisley's so like the one that is the last stop that will say, whoa, 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 we're not signed off on this. Brandy, Lakita, look at this. You know, we've got some issues here. So there's ownership from the bottom up of the whole process of how to do that. And I'll share with you that when I first arrived here, um, I was concerned by the way that the cards were currently being distributed. I think there were about maybe three people card and my card was to be used by other individuals to make purchases. I came from a system, a very good system that we have started in my previous job. We were part of the first key card and purchase card group. So Tamika and I are very, very familiar with the processes. While we do recognize that there's been a lot of there's been a lot of public discussion because of some issues that were done by some elected officials. But what I would like for the board to know is that we are working very this is something I've been working on since the day I came in. So this was not something we just started because we wanted to make sure that when we bought this to you, that it was bought correctly. And I just would like to share our current process does not work effectively nor efficiently to run an agency this size. Coming in, getting my car, getting to meet the car, getting Brandy car, Jamie car, is just not a good way to do business. And I know there was a question of like, Ooh, are you going to trust your people car? Well, you shouldn't have people you don't trust. And so we are trusting people that are in position and we're going to hold them accountable through training and through um, just following through. So I do want to make sure that I share that because I know it's like, oh my gosh, we've heard this key card issue, but feel confident that you're an executive director and you're definitely director. We've been through this rodeo before and we know how to get it done. And your CFO, procurement management, and as well as our Legal counsel are fully ready to implement this way. You are also ready and comfortable. This is not something that we want to just throw out there, but we want to take the time to go through. Thank I'm, you. I'm assuming that now that maybe we don't have but is are these monthly checks when we file these checks for that? Yeah. yeah. Like four years down the road, we want to go back and check on you know March of Yep. We and that is in the policy. We have to retain all your statements, all your receipts. Um and as Lakita said about the bit about people purchasing stuff with your cards, I mean, I feel like my heart just kind of jumped a little bit at that. <laughs> um, we specifically have in the policy, I think a lot of this, it's got to go back to owner. Specifically says you may not transact any purchase with a P card if you are not, your name is not on the card. That is step one, you cannot do that. And that's because at the end of the month, when Lakita's trying to put her card together, she's got purchases that she didn't, you know, transact, and then she's got to get a receipt. You know, that just that that breaks that ownership and responsibility down. So this helps direct ownership. It funnels down to one singular person, and it's you know it's on them. If someone's misusing the card, it's going to be very evident. Um, and there are a lot of people checking behind it. And if they are misusing it, then they lose the privilege, mm -hmm. and they're probably in comfort. <laughs> <laughs> and there probably is a follow up conversation about if someone is abusing that privilege. You know, mistake, mis be worse than that. Mistakes happen, but it probably also means that from a policy standpoint, the HR handbook probably needs to be updated to also conform to abuses of the PCAR process because that needs to be an automatic. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
And I will say, Shirley, that there are, um, we do have some stuff that, you know, maybe not in the list. You lose a receipt more than three times, that's a violation. You know, stuff that probably isn't malicious, but you're held to a higher standard. If you have a key card, you need to be responsible adult and keep your receipts. So, you know, there are instances where, you know, perhaps someone would violate the key card, but maybe they wouldn't necessarily, you know, face termination or something like that because of violation. Like an accidental use, but our card would be probably neon, orange, or green or something, so that when you pull that out of your wallet, you will know that it's an RCRC card. You will not look like your other card. So, so, you so. Use it on your trip and you get Exactly. And we have, we also, in the policies, require that the card state that it is for official purposes only, so that hopefully they're, you know, they're not all this, you know, hopefully whoever is transacting it will do this. Um, so there are, I think we have put a lot of thought into stop gaps and making sure, kind of making people be responsible and then forcing them to be responsible, you know. Um, the next policy that we worked on with staff is The procurement policy and the key card policies, though they may not seem like it, but they surely go hand in hand with the FOIA policy because um, from working with clients on their FOIA requests, a lot of times they are centered around procurement processes and transactions. And so that's when people are going to be asking about the contract you entered into. Boy, if they're nosy enough to know about that contract, you better believe that they have looked at your procurement code and they're going to know if you haven't done it right. Um, and that is, you know, stuff that we have dealt with. And so when you have these policies, you also have the FOIA policy there too. Um, and the FOIA policy establishes a rate schedule. There are certain documents that the public has to have access to for free. Those are minutes and agendas. Um, those they get at no cost. You know, if they are asking for receipts from March 24, 2019, there is going to be a charge for the staff hours of filling and digging up those receipts. There's a charge for the copies. You know, someone shouldn't be able. There is some, reper not repercussions, but there is some weight put on the staff when they do these FOIA requests. So it's kind of nice to have a fiscal impact to the person requesting it so that they recognize, you know, all right, you know, there is a human putting in work to this FOIA request, it kind of yeah. would potentially slow down someone from saying, you know, please give me all receipts from every key card for the year 2017 to the year 20, you know, kind of can put some thought behind that. Um, however, district has nothing to hide. If they want stuff, give it to them. You know, that's where you're confident in your bylaws, your procurement policy, you're confident in the training that's been put in place and you know that people are doing the right things. So you do want to say, take it, take it all. Um, but again, it goes back to just the, the time. Have you, have you done this? It also can, it also can be forgotten. Just the yeah. last half. Suggested yeah. rates mm -hmm. yeah. so um, The rates so, are so. kind of mandated. The hourly rate for staff has to be the lowest hourly rate of a person qualified to do the work. So not your lowest. I'm just saying, long as we just do it this conforming and consistent with other agencies. So, so this is this is kind of off the shelf policy. We probably have 30 or 40 clients that adopt this policy almost for a except for, the, for, the, for that lowest hour probably fee number um, because depending on who your staff person is, you can that back. But that, what Sarah kind of points to here and that what is behind this is, is you don't, FOIA policy is not required um, because state law specifically lays out what you're required to do when you receive a FOIA. Any request you receive for a document that is considered public is required to be turned over within the statutory time. But what this is basically doing is saying, okay, when we receive a FOIA request, we now have an internal practice where it doesn't sit on um, court's desk for five days and you miss the statutory deadline. You miss the deadline, even if you have an exemption, it's deemed it's deemed approved. Um, or you know what the responsibility is for that particular staff person, so it does get processed. Right? So it's identifying a check. Avoid abuses, and this is not to say, look, we're trying to receive some giant windfall of cash from the public at large, but there is a true cost associated with, with yeah. filling out. With Lawrence, we, um, I guess what I'm trying to get to is like, let's just say, um, citizen why, and I ask Lakita to see, I, I can't just ask her to look at, oh, I want to look at credit card bills from 
this person. You can't just go and ask to do that, can you? Absolutely. Anybody can do that. Any person. But at the same time, time we can't have our like agency. It's a giant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that's the reason that you have to have policies in place to yes. say, okay, you don't just get this, you know, ad hoc. Like there is a there's a you know, and you don't have to turn it up, you don't have to stop everything you're doing. Mm -hmm. The person comes you know, in former times when people walk in the door, they come and knock on the door and say, Hey, I want to see this. You can say, Great. We have a policy, it's on our website, put it all, come bring it back, and we'll turn it around and stack for a time. Now, the policy or your the application, if they put your request, it's still a formal request, and then start the statutory timeline, and you're still required to conform to it. So but, long as it's in writing. But but you know, if they if they come and they ask for a thousand pages worth of key card receipts. Well, you can charge them 20 cents a page to, to be able to do that. You can also go in because there are things in there that are, are personally identifying uh, information. If, if you pulled information on there because it's someone's credit card or their P card and it's got their social security number in there, you absolutely have a duty to go in and redact that. Well, then staff has to take the time to go in and redact it. That time of, of, of doing it, you can then bill back at, the, at, their, at their hourly rate. And so you can say, okay. Why does it have to be the lowest rate? It's stable. Mm -hmm. If state law says that you you're, you can only request the reimbursement of the lowest qualified person at their hourly rate to be able to turn it over. Right. Do we, we to go ahead and redact sixty documents? We can set the amount of time that takes. Yes, right? absolutely. And so there there you know, some of this is a little bit subjective, but it, and so there are also requirements um, that if it's in, in the policy that if it's over a certain threshold, um, then. They're required to put in a deposit. I was say, you going to have to deposit. That's yeah. right. And on top of that, you can go through the process because a lot of people will just file to do some employer oh, requests, sorry, or they'll use it to end run discovery process if you think you can pursue it or something. You can't stop that, but you can stop it if it's being used for personal solicitation or commercial solicitation. That's actually a recent amendment to the case. Um, but we can talk about that's actually what the next kind of following the following point of, of, of this FOIA policy, but we wanted or the FOIA discussion because. Outside of the record side, FOIA kind of has two practical purposes. You got the production of public records, which are gen you know, the, the general rule of thumb is that it's produced publicly unless it's come from your lawyer or something that's otherwise protected from the economic development platform or proprietary information from a vendor. It's going to be a public record. You got to turn it over with that process. And then there's also is the follow on for meeting. That's kind of the next part of, of this discussion we're going to have. And so what I'll say is we've got about 15 more minutes in our allocated time. I can burn through that real quick or if y'all want to take a break. I, I know we've thrown a ton at you so far. Uh, we can burn through it. If that's what y'all just want to say, just keep moving through, we'll do that. Yeah, go ahead. You can find <laughs> <laughs> I'll turn it over to Lawrence for this part. So, like I said, we're, we're, we've touched on policies all of these, none of these policies are written in stone at this point. Everything is a working draft. But the goal was to come out of this discussion today, give you some, some food for thought, and say, okay, you know, there are really some, there's, in addition to the data, there's actually some meat here, and we need to make some decisions on it. So, um, and we kind of brought to a close today. There's nothing like talking through FOIA to really, you know, put an end cap on discussion for a board retreat. And so as I actually alluded to a second ago, um, public records, we're not going to really dig into that too, too in depth. We read the policy, it's pretty straightforward about what we do. Um, you know, we, we at least now have a solicitation form. I would say put it on your website. It gives people the opportunity to come in and make a request. And people are there. But what we're going to talk about a little bit more is the idea of conducting a public meeting. We kind of hit on all these record uh, uh, types of, of discussions uh, in policy discussions. Sarah's talked about it. Um, so these, are, these are kind of all of our best practices. All of these best practices are incorporated into the terms of the employee policy that, that is in your uh, Okay, so FOIA is probably the most outside of HR matters or or insurance or stuff, it is the most litigated section of local government law that's generally out there. And the reason is, is because 
the public at large has a right to know what's being what, what's going on, what people had 10 or 15 cases in the last 10 years on FOIA specific issues. Fortunately or unfortunately, the city of Columbia has been the lead plaintiff in a lot of those. Um, and, and it's they've made a lot of law. And as a result of that, the legislature got mad enough that even though they're subject to FOIA, they made some fairly significant changes to the FOIA statute in 2017, particularly around the idea of how public meetings are all in. So the old rule used to be you adopted your, your list of, of meetings for the year, you adopted those as long as the public agenda knew about it, you didn't have to have a post of, of an agenda. Um, you had to have an agenda for a special call meeting, um, but you didn't have to have one for your regular meeting because the public would be aware. That changed. It. You have to have an agenda for every single meeting that is otherwise implemented by the commission. And that agenda has to be put, put out publicly on your website. <clears throat> if you maintain one, obviously you did 24 hours in advance of the meeting. You can't four hour window as to the showing of exigent circumstances. So what is an exigent circumstance? It's the idea that we're here in a pandemic today and you needed to call and you know, give yourself the authorization to hold electronic media or give yourself some special procurement authorization. You could do that because we actually have the, the, the ability to declare an exigent circumstance. But generally speaking, you know, if you wake up on the morning of, of a meeting, you can't just tack something onto the agenda for approval um, because that's going to violate FOIA. And as we've talked about earlier, FOIA has now become this kind of backdoor route to challenge the actions of local government because if you haven't complied with FOIA, it's an absolute grounds to then invalidate the actions that you take, um, which, is a, which is a real problem because if, you, if the litigant wins on a FOIA complaint, not only do they invalidate the actions, but they also get to recover a return, um, which can be a fairly significant practice. The problem with that is also is it's kind of created an underground practice for lawyers who know that if they find a FOIA violation, they just sue you for the heck of it because they know they're going to recover, recover the attorneys. Um, so here, you know, we talked about what, what the agenda needs to look like. Um, for, for changes to that agenda, for example, uh, at ACES, for example, it requires a, a supermajority vote to do it and a determination of that. What's that word again? ACES, for, so basically an emergency circumstance that would otherwise apply for you to be able to make some. So a meeting is defined, is defined as any, you know, this, this, this idea of the convening of a forum for basically uh, any decision to, to operate publicly. The most important thing that's probably happened in 2020 in local government is this, I think, is a throwaway line from FOIA was enacted in the early 80s, was the idea of meeting by means of corporal, uh, whether corporal by means of electronic equipment. That is the authorization for every local government in the state that held their meeting electronically. Um, over the last year. As of that language, there would have been no authorization to hold electronic public meetings. And we've also part the ability to meet electronically with some commissioners electronic, some in person. Um, hopefully we never have another pandemic like this again, but you know, to give y'all that flexibility in the future going forward. But but that is an yeah, that, that's a very good point, Sarah. In your bylaws, we've explicitly stated this kind of hybrid authorization that then conforms to FOIA, but says, well, what is an electronic meeting for our persons? When this was passed, this was assumed it was element. The, the internet wasn't obviously invented. So the idea of being able to meet via Zoom, um, you know, uh, or with this concept of being electronic and proportion of you being physically. We've now specifically identified by the terms of your draft bylaws that a quorum constitutes the representative membership either appearing in person or electronically. So if we were to hold a public meeting today, you know, we obviously noticed it, it was actually put on your website. But Ms. Donzetta would be considered harsh, a part of that quorum because when you adopt those bylaws, electronic participation is explicitly deemed to be a participant. Um, uh, um, Making sure that you have a quorum. If you don't have a quorum, you are not permitted to do public business. You have to have a quorum to be able to operate as an organization. So that's a that's an issue um, that you know we probably would need to address as well. Because the constituted membership of this board, um, there's a question of whether or not your your five members is the correct number. You should really have seven. Do vacancies um, on board right now as a result of 
Um, um, not having those appointments otherwise come through by the term back express term your day session. Um, so if you're required to have a, a, a full operation, that means that really to do business, you need to have four members to constitute four. What can we do to help our legislation bring up on this? Because when you say we don't have control of the actual appointments and stuff, but like we have board members we're getting ready to go to roll off. Yeah. Um, and so I will say, so when a board member rolls off, they are deemed to, you know, unless they resign, they can stay on on and holdover status until they, they're a fair number of pieces of legislative uh, of cases out there that say, especially when it comes to board governance, it's safe going to be your your turn ends on the end, say it ended on January one, and you still showed up to the meeting that you're deemed in holdover status. If you took an action to approve a contract, that action is valid until your status as a board member will challenge. So if someone then sued and said, well, oh, is no longer authorized to serve on the board, and the court said, yeah, you're right, he's invalid, it's not going to invalidate the former action because you were serving in a de facto valid capacity to the the action. But you got challenged, and then you showed up to the next meeting, pulled the George hands up, at that point, you were then invalid, and that actually was not otherwise. All that? Okay. Yeah, exactly. Um, so that's that's the you know, consideration. But getting back to your original point, the, the this is this is a real issue. I have um, I have a number of clients. If I'm this is not not to say that y'all's positions are not very important, but unless you are, have a legislative delegation that's really interested in, in in being a part of that discussion, you're kind of out of sight and out of mind. You know, my, my advice to most of my special purpose clients, and Lakeith has heard me say this before, someone from this office, from this organization should be attending every single meeting of the legislative delegation. And that's not to say you, because obviously you, you're a political appointment, mm -hmm. you know, parent. If someone from the staff level organization needs to be at those legislative delegation meetings, because there is a public forum where they say, you know, they're looking for people to show up and say stuff. If you're there and you develop that report, that's the best way to do it, is for them to know who you are, know how you're operating, and, and we've had the conversation. It probably makes sense once a year for you to show up to the legislative delegation and say, hey, this is a 15 minutes top of everything that the Recreation District has done the last year. We really appreciate your help. Oh, but by the way, I have you know two vacancies on my board and three members in We need to address that. And if they know who you are and you've been you know, really quick about staying in front of them, that's going to go a long way towards addressing that issue. But otherwise, they have carte blanche authorization, and the governor's office will not take action to a point unless they have that recommendation. So you have this, there's a hitch in the giddy up. Uh, they're not, he's not going to just take independent authorization and access them. It's got to come from the delegation. All right, so executive session, this is probably the area that is. The most abused. Um, what I tell folks all the time is this there's an authorization for an executive session. Just because something qualifies for executive session, just like some, just if something were to qualify as being exempt from disclosure under FOIA, at the end of the day, the decision as to whether or not to do something behind closed doors, it has to fall with one of, within one of the five authorized purposes. But you don't have to do that. At the end of the day, it's the board decision as to whether or not you want to do this closed doors. I would always generally advise that I'm providing legal advice on litigation. You don't do that in public setting. You can do that behind closed doors. And the executive session privilege applies to you, but there is no punishment for violating. At the end of the day, it is an inherent function to be able to operate your organization as a commission as efficiently as possible that you can know the discussions happen in the executive stay in there. But there's no criminal penalty if you go out and tell the newspaper what happened. Um, there is penalties associated with taking action while you're in executive session um, because you're not the public doesn't know what you're what, what you're doing. Um, and so that's exactly what we talked about before the um, termination contract with the former Christian County uh, administrator was determined to have been approved at least validly or in the fact of basis in executive session that then served as the grounds to invalidate the contract. Um, that's obviously a major problem when we're talking about spending more dollars. The key to putting an executive session on your agenda 
this crap is directly out of the um, out of the, the, the chat. And so it's for employment matters, basically anything associated with direct you know input on on an employee. If you got someone stealing money, you don't want to stick with any by name, you want know, that, that that briefing and executive session that's right. Negotiations on the sale of property. This doesn't give you the ability to sell property, but you talk about it you want to receive legal advice and a pretty broad authorization. So basically, if your lawyer shows up, you get an authorization. Um, personnel, uh, security devices, um, investigative proceedings, that's obviously more of a, a local government, a local government session. And then economic development, which is probably not going to be one that y'all use very often. The important thing. Um, is in making those determinations, you have to announce with specificity the specific purpose. And the reason that this is pretty important to us is we were at the city of Augusta, we were doing, we, when we financed their new uh, baseball stadium, there were challenge on the validity of extending a test project, but also on the, on the basis for why. We went into executive session, and executive session simply just the, the recital on the agenda says um, executive session will receive legal advice, which is expressly out of the statute. We got challenged on whether or not that was a sufficient disclosure as to the reasoning to go into executive session. And my partner at the time, when he was arguing this this motion to the or arguing the point to the Supreme Court, said, <coughs> "Court, you say that you have to plead." The reason for going into executive session with particularity, give us a bright line test. What does particularity mean? And of course, they punished on it. They validated, uh, or that they, they held that our executive session disclosure was incorrect, but they didn't give us the bright line test. So, generally speaking, what we attempt to do now is add a little bit of additional authorization. So, if you're going in executive session for an employment matter, don't just say employment matter, say we're referencing, you know, it's going as a Talking about the practical negotiations, talk about the parties. So, if you said legal advice to <coughs> discuss the stadium, correct. That would have been fine. That would have been fine. So, it's a, it's a technical nuance, but it's one of those that you can only do your business in a publicly held meeting. Your agenda then puts people on notice as to what you're doing in that meeting. And if you go into an executive session for an invalid purpose and someone challenges you, they're going to win and they're going to recover their attorney's fees for that. That was, those are just kind of some suggestions based on what we talked about. Um, kind of as a last, a last issue, just to generally touch on, this is the probably the, the most abused area. Remember, anything that you do in your capacity as a public commissioner, which is the reason that staff probably has their cell phone or email address, <coughs> but if you have a group text chain. Among members of this commission, which that, uh, where you know you're just getting information out there. If y'all start corresponding on that text chain or on that email, you're doing the public business, and you're doing the public business behind closed doors. And so, as a result of that, that is a, that is not a chance meeting. That is a potential action to be able to to, to to do public business. And so, if you got FOIA, first of all, it may result in your because you're transacting public business over your own cell phone. Will say, yeah, you got to turn over your entire personal cell phone, and then we determine whether or not we're going to redact. And if you're determined to be doing public business behind closed doors over a cell phone, you didn't probably have that action otherwise invalidated. So, no one has been abused on this yet, but I don't want y'all to be the group. So, to get if, I send, <laughs> if I send a text to everybody, you're running late. Is that for you? That, is that, that, that is a spoilable issue. Because remember, when FOIA was drafted, it was in the 80s, they didn't have the text message was. Uh -huh. So it's any public record in which you're doing public business. And so that did create public record. Who's considered a meeting again? Here's that one. Convening a form of the decision membership, whether by court ordering or by electronic equipment. We don't know what electronic equipment is. A quorum is. The civil majority is your membership. Sorry, it's in the three. Correct. Three That's the way to enter it. Now, I have a few clients that have done that. 
I'm just saying if you're going to just do basic stuff. No, I 100% agree. That technically does not violate FOIA. And so I've been in plenty of situations where we've had constituent city council meetings where you have to bring in two members, and then 30 minutes later, you bring in two more members, and 30 minutes later, you bring in another two members. That does not violate, that may violate the spirit of FOIA. It does not violate FOIA. Question. Um, <coughs> I'm not personal. Um, I text individually. About a manner or a meeting, is that going to If I put yes. all of them on one set, if you send them a text message in the capacity for public official business, it becomes a public record. Where she texts us about who you feel should go out That's okay. <laughs> I mean, if, 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 well, it's a matter of the catering, if it's the catering, you know, yeah. center for the meeting, they're asking what you want. <laughs> Ideally, you're going to that. That's a foil of yeah. That <laughs> Unless you do it individually. I, I mean, there really is no reason for you to be transacting business with staff on anything that would otherwise be, unless you have a personal relationship outside of day-to-day -day operations. Everything that you do with staff or amongst yourselves is likely done as a result of your role as a commission or your member here, your role as a staff. So I guess that's my question too. So that includes me if I send a message to the three of those people in the back to leave the door open, that's a part of me directing them in sport. Absolutely. Okay. I do want to point something out here that seems like it might be getting lost a little bit. Anything from staff is believable. So, Lakita, if, if you're texting Chair Lakita, if you were to text Lakita, because Lakita is staff, even though it's just two of y'all, that's believable. The three people comes in when it's the commission in a meeting. But if you're so it's business. So, you know, if you're texting, if it's just the two of you, if they're a staff member, it's still fully able. The two, three distinction, four distinction is when it's amongst yourselves as commissioners. So, and so the other piece of that is on attorney client privilege, because <clears throat> this happens, I have a lot of clients that have done this too, especially with email. They'll put me into the email chain to then create, <coughs> I'm sorry, to create an attorney client privilege. Which means that it's then otherwise not subject to FOIA because it's protecting the trade line for the privilege material. Please don't do that. That's good. But that is what that is what Sandy Cooper tried to argue on the fact that we're losing their lawyer and it's the trade line privilege. Now, if you put me on your your text chain. And then you also put on someone that is outside the scope of the organization. Um, you lose attorney client privilege as a result of the third party beneficiary. And that being said, I still say don't try to transact them over email via text on a chance meeting. And the one that always come up is, oh, we have a Christmas party. Well, you're not, you're coming together, you're not coming together for the purpose of doing the public business. If you talk about it, you know, maybe you know, people will notice a Christmas party. But if you all happen to have, you know, if, if Rob decides to throw a Christmas party and invites all the commissioners and you show up, you're not planning to do public business. That's not a public meeting. But if you could start, if, you, you know, if someone's there and you have some local government gas line that sees the four of you talking and say, well, I think you have to maybe talk about building a new rec facility, all of a sudden then you tell them about public it's, it's a slippery slope. And the problem is we don't know how slippery that slope is. So let's say we go to the national conference and we go out and get some crabs. Having a few beers, we're talking, and now with your pee card, we're those beers. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, look, so we got wine now. There, there, <laughs> no, there, look, there, there are there's some great beer. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, so that's the rabbit hole. <laughs> I'm just gonna be quiet. <laughs> I'm just saying, um, yeah, no, it's, it's, a, it's a good question. Now, the, the bigger question is, is how do you create a record of that? If, if there's no record produced. Well, I'm saying usually when we go to these conferences, we will go out to dinner, of course, and we're hanging out, you know. And, and so at the end of the day, as long as you're not, you know, I think I think at some level, common sense, that's also been the day. As long as you're not meeting, and then you come back, and you all know, work out some grand scheme, and then you show up to a public meeting, and you, know, you vote on a, you vote to, to reopen some part, or you spend five hundred thousand dollars. So let me ask you: Do you see a presentation 
at one of these things and say, hey, I really like that presentation on the way that they use data to create a decision about how to create a program for the parties. So that's us discussion is something that we're learning about for, as opposed to, um, you know, at Kelly Mill Road, um, we're going to build a park just like this. That's that's a zoo. Like, like just as opposed about, to just being. All right, I think that's all I have. I'm just gonna what? Say, One other question, Lawrence. Just on the on the self on the text, and I want to get this straight. So, if I move to an office um, um, RCRC cell phone and I'm texting them on their personal phone, how far back can they ask for my personal cell phone records if a FOIA comes about about something that happened today? Far back as the record is up on there. They can what? As far back as the record exists. Okay, so it really doesn't matter. I can just keep using my social media. Absolutely. So, yeah, you know, there, there are folks that say, look, I don't want my personal cell phone to ever be intercepted as a public record. So, I have lots of clients that carry a work phone and a personal phone, and they are very intentional about transacting business only over their, their, their work phone when they're doing work phones. And that's the document that you're otherwise going to see. But you may have, you know, the state newspaper reported when New York University of South Carolina the resident, they FOIA every member of the, the Board of Trustees' personal cell phone, and they found they were transacting business about who was who the candidates were, and they published that newspaper. They focus only on the conversation that was specific to the work, or do they pull like all of them? That's that's the problem. Is as soon as you interject your personal business, then where is the line? From? So I'm doing right. But at the end of the day, that is the question. And so you know, you, you want to be you want to be really careful about it because you are inherently operating for the benefit of the public. You are spending public dollars. And so, like it or not, we get a very explicit authorization. And so, the other thing, there was a case that came out last week, I think, um, uh, against Mississippi. No, it was, I think it was out of the upstate. I, I don't remember who the, who the local government was, but it was about record retention. And they're what your policies on retaining records are. So this gets back to, to Ms. Horn's question a minute ago. Is, is what is the responsibility for retaining records? State law says that you're basically supposed to, apply to maintain public records for at least seven years, or you work through the Department of Archives as to how you archive public, public records. Well, they had a corrupted email server that, that terminated all their public records and they got pulled in and they couldn't produce it. And at least the court had some common sense to say, well, it's not a violation if by you know by happenstance or you know some force majeure you lost all the record you don't have to you know, you're gonna penalize you but there's a fine line there where if someone's being very intentional about erasing the text and you don't have a policy as to what your retention is then it looks very arbitrary if you get if you, if you get if you get spoiled and you say well you know we purposely actually have a record of that. You need to make sure that we conform to the, the, the same requirements on record retention. But I would say it makes sense to have a policy in place for record retention. The last one I will point out on there, and this is Ms. Moore, um, under the Rockers Mount that was a case, put an executive session on every <coughs> board agenda, no matter what you did. Um, that is basically the, the in, in Brock, there was a whole bunch of litigation over um, some development agreements that were occurring down in Mount Pleasant. They had an executive session on there. And even if you just put an executive session on your agenda to put the public on notice, and you don't announce with particularity in writing as to what the purpose is, so long as you announce that publicly so it's recorded in the minutes, the reason that you're going in, you can then go into an executive session for whatever that purpose is. And then you can also take action coming out of the executive session on that particular item, so long as you have a line item in your agenda that says action to be taken on matters. So that's just something to be involved. Do you have to amend the agenda in the beginning? Just authorized the 20 to 24 hours in advance of the day. 
So if you have just a placeholder that says executive session on the agenda, okay. then you come into the meeting and you announce the reason you're going into the executive session. The public is then put, put on notice that an executive session could occur. And if you decide you don't need it at the end of the meeting, then you say, yeah, we don't need an executive session. You don't need it. What about like, scrawl? Like, is there an issue that we're talking about? You can take no action in the executive and so strong, so strong would be that is an informal action. So that's yes or no. That is no. Mm -hmm. Okay. 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 Not a rule for being a public service. <laughs> and the goal here was not to scare everyone today, but you know, if, if, if you haven't been through this before, mm -hmm. there you just you gotta you gotta kind of know where the rubber meets the road. This is very helpful. Like yeah, I really like what I really like the ideas and how you're gonna make all of these different policies um kind of meld or you know so that one's not contradicting the other. And I sure. think that that's crucial. That, that is certainly the goal is to make you as streamlined and efficient to have the documentation behind while you're doing. Um, and that, that helps your staff. Is there a policy after we review these policies that's about to be amended? Or are you? We have to approve all these. No, no. We have to approve all these. Yeah. Is there anything else that's still being reviewed? Oh, yes. Yeah. There's a lot. A lot. Oh, and, and if you go backwards, kind of like last year, what we've been doing is bringing the policy to every board meeting. Um, because we wanted to eventually get to the point where we had to treat and we went through all the policies. But um, to be very honest with you, there's just a lot of outdated things that we are taking um, a priority list and our human resources policy, our first group of policies, and then, of course, where Lawrence has identified some deficiencies or areas that we need to fill the gaps procurement and FOIA and um, as a portion of our So it's an ongoing process for this year. And I would say, outside the ones that we've identified, procurement and FOIA are probably the two that, that absolutely need to be addressed. PCAR, if you're going to implement it, absolutely needs to be addressed. And then the following, HR is an absolute butt -hat. So I want to commend uh, Lakita and her staff on the job well done with these issues. Uh, with Lakita coming in, we had the concerns of everything we just talked about. Um, I think the train is on the track. Um, we're heading in the right direction. Uh, keep up with the good work. Uh, we, we need to make the change. Let's make the change because we, we ask for it. And anytime you do a culture change, it's a whole lot of things need to go into it. And also convincing staff to get on board, to ride the train in the right direction. We're doing things wrong for so long. And we can't punish them for it, but we need to get them on track to move forward. And I, I, I commend you. I have an awesome team uh, here that's been working diligently. Thank you again, Lawrence, um, for you and your team, for your input, and you as a board, you're, you have been very supportive. I um, know we don't always agree, but this is why we grow. Um, in order to grow, you got to get a little uncomfortable. And we've been uncomfortable, but we are growing. So thank you again, Lawrence. I know that we do have another session. I know that Chair Lapine does have to leave, so if we can switch and maybe take a five minute break um, yeah. and get back to go ahead and get set up. Yeah. Um, again, yeah. um, we can get a round of applause for Lawrence um, and for Thank you all for having us. Yeah, Lawrence, we're uh, Rob X, and I can get CLE credit for your presentation. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was a great question. <laughs> yeah, we can submit, we can submit the material. <laughs> 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 So we will go into break now. If we can go into pause, Jamie. Great. All right, we are now about to go into our second half of the retreat. I would like to introduce to you Mr. Matthew Christman, who is our recreation superintendent. Matthew joined us in March. It was in March of 2020, right at May. May. So he hasn't done a year yet, but he joins us from the state of Arizona. I don't know how to introduce himself. But today I wanted to give this presentation. I have to give this presentation because we feel that as we look at our strategic goals in the county, 
and we have an opportunity to really take advantage of sports tourism. We've identified some great opportunities currently, and we want to share with the board some of our future thoughts, which will lead us into capital improvement, planning, and budgeting. Um, so with that, I will turn the presentation over to Mr. Christian. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Commissioner. Thank you. I come before you to talk about sports tourism. Uh, like you just said, I am I came from Arizona. I worked there for seven years. Um, I've been in parks and recreation for 12 years. Um, I started my career in the city of St. Louis um, as a part-time staff, worked my way up, and then I started uh, my first full-time staff, uh, first full-time job was uh, in uh, Decatur, Illinois, um, and then I moved out to Arizona. So uh, I'm just going to get into the sports tourism. Uh, great opportunity for Richland County to get into. Um, it's something that we're starting to get into a little bit right now, and at the end of the presentation, I talk about what we're bringing uh, tournament-wise to us uh, first. So the first thing about sports tourism is that the definition of it. Sports tourism is traveling in order to observe or participate in a sporting event. The sporting event has to be the primary reason of travel in order to be considered sports tourism because if the sport doesn't revolve around it, that's just tourism. It's not sports tourism. And then um, individuals are attending uh, outside their area, and that's increased. 180 million people traveled for sporting events in 2019, uh, resulting in $103.3 billion of economic impact of sports uh, economics. So there's three types of uh, sports tourism. Event-based sports tourism. Um, this is based off of individuals who are traveling the fanatic with our fans. The participatory, uh, so if I go and do a triathlon, I'm the person, I'm a sports tourist because I'm going to participate. Then there's a uh, celebratory to sports tourists. That's the people that are going to the Hall of Fame, uh, museums, every, uh, mo most of them are uh, pro football team. They have their own Hall of Fame. They have their own museum, but they're bringing in tourists that way. So that's where there's three different kinds of sports tourism. So the benefits of sports tourism, bringing in money to the community. That could be hotels, it could be restaurants, it could be gas stations. Uh, like if we charge admission to get into that tournament, uh, concessions, uh, anything associated with uh, that event is good for the community because you're bringing in money from the outside to your community. Then uh, it leads to other tourism. So when people come to your sporting event, uh, say they come to Rizal County, they might drive their numbers and help in their tourism dollars as well. Because when people, they might be at the tournament for two, three, four hours, then they have the downtime in the evening, so they might look at doing something else with their family and friends. And then it could be, if, another reason is it leads to a great PR, so if you provide a great experience for the outside people, they're going to talk with their friends, family about their experience that they had at your facility or complex or whatever um, facility they have uh, that you're having their tournament at. And then um, it builds a great community relationship. So you're going to have sponsorships with local businesses. You're also going to have uh, local partnerships. Yes, we uh, currently already have um, field uh, user agreements with some of our local leads, but it could be that there was another entity that we're not familiar with and they come to us as well. So it, it, it helps build those relationships that we might not already have. And then, um, we don't know, currently know about. And then giving an experience. So we're looking at sports tourism generates experience among the individuals and develops a positive image for the community, when individuals are participating in sporting events on a, day, on a continuous basis, they enhance their experience. So when you're deciding on what um, tournament you're gonna go to, the experience is what is driving that because there's a lot of tournaments. So as a club team, uh, I get to decide where I go because if I had a positive experience, I'm gonna make sure that I go back to that tournament. So that's what the main focus is, is to give that experience the best that we can 
for the outside people because we would always want them to come back to us. So I'm going to go through a couple of venues that are in uh, South Carolina. Uh, the Rock Hill Sports uh, and Event Center is a 170,000 square foot facility. They have a championship course that seats 1,200 people. Uh, they have eight spectator areas. And then uh, during the pandemic, they've generated 60 million of economic impact um, for that. So we, um, even in a certain times that are going on now, there's still sports tourism happening, and that's something to say too. This one facility at Rock Hill during the pandemic, every you know, just one economic impact, correct? The impact, the impact. The impact. Okay. not not the revenue. Hotels, restaurants. Yeah, not revenue. It's economic impact. And they hosted during this pandemic. We had a state. Yes, we had a state group of us from different departments and commission that communicated as we were going through COVID-19. And Rock Hill was the first to say, we have an enterprise fund associated with this. We have to continue to move forward. And they were able to successfully do it without um, expanding or having additional uh, cases of COVID. So I didn't want to show that. And then the second uh, venue is the Myrtle Beach Sports Center. It's a 100,000 square foot facility. It has eight basketball courts and 16 volleyball courts. It's actually standing in spectator area. Uh, we could, I couldn't find uh, their numbers uh, if they posted at some of them uh, what their economic impact was during the pandemic as well. And these are all current photos of those facilities. It's not stock photos. <laughs> and then uh, North Myrtle Beach Park and Sports Complex. This is a little bit different. So the first two were just indoor components. This is strictly outdoor components. So this is six baseball and softball fields, eight multi-use fields for soccer, football, um, lacrosse, uh, multi-use uh, field. They have eight batting tum uh, tunnels. They have a 25 acre lake. Uh, so if they want to fish, if they want to have uh, skiing events, water sports, uh, they have that capability of doing that there as well. They have an amphitheater and then around the complex, biking trails along with three playgrounds. So it's not just a sports complex, they also have park um, aspects as well. So now I'm gonna talk about economic impact. So we, I was working with uh, Synergy Sports Global to come up with a high level, uh, if you built a $40 million uh, facility that had indoor and outdoor components, what that economic impact would look like. So there's three phases to building a $40 million complex. The first is a construction phase. From the numbers that um, Jason with uh, Synergy Sports Global came up with, $70 million of economic impact would happen just in the construction phase alone. So that is consultants, it's design, it's everything associated with um, the construction phase of that project. So. 450 jobs would be created or supported. So if we had a subcontractor come in, there's this creating a new job because that subcontractor is already there. So the 450 uh, jobs were created or supported, and then $7.7 .7 million would be generated in tax revenue for that, just that one phase. Then if, when we go to daily operation, this is covering um, like our rec leagues, um, People coming into the facility, if we had a fitness uh, component, if we had a track, uh, daily rentals, all that kind of, um, and it started with one year going through five years. It, it's an annual progression that way. So it would be 59 million of economic impact that's indirect and direct uh, with the facility as well. So 277 jobs would be created or supported in that. And then 5.3 million uh, would be generated tax uh, revenue as well. So with the uh, tour tournaments and events, this is based off of having in year one, it would be 140 events, moving to 220 events by year five. 40,000 to 185,000 visitors to that facility. And then that would result in a uh, 30,000 to 40,000 uh, hotel nights. 
um, in that year five. So this is 27 million of economic impact would be generated in year one and moving towards year five as well. 240 jobs would be created or supported with this uh, economic impact. And then 3 million would be generated in tax revenue from that as well. So this is a very high level um, analysis. Um, because obviously there's other components. If you start tweaking what kind of facility you want, if you want aquatics, then that it divvies it out a little bit. But this is a high level that we had in indoor uh, sports, basketball, volleyball, along with uh, football, uh, soccer, and across the way. So I'm going to talk about the upcoming tournaments that were already bringing to RCRC. So the very first one is the AU basketball. They're bringing our super regional here, March 12th through the 14th. We're using four parks. Uh, we're using Blakewood, Meadow Lake, Marsh Springs, and Polo Road. The reason for that is we don't have a multi-court facility, so we have to spread it out. And they were okay. They came down and looked at the facilities, and they were okay with us breaking it out that way. Uh, we're also bringing in an AU Taekwondo uh, tournament. Uh, competition on March 13th at Killian Park. And then we um, have gotten approval from the Braves. Uh, we're going to do the Braves Country Battle April 16th to the 18th at Kelly Mill. And then if it spills over, um, depending on how many teams they have, we're going to use North Springs Park as well um, for that because it could be that they have 40 teams. If we have 40 teams, uh, we could do it just at Kelly Mill, but if we get 60 teams, we have to have both facilities up, up and running. And with this agreement, uh, we were helping, uh, we got help with uh, Experience Columbia, <coughs> which is the uh, city of Columbia as well. And Scott Powers, uh, we actually got a, a proposal and Braves agreed to it uh, for three years. So they're coming back for three years now. It's not just a one time. And what uh, is good about the Braves is they're looking to invest in the community as well. So they have um, an arm that is uh, the charitable arm. So they could look at doing uh, field renovations. It could be that they build us a new field. It's all what our needs are and what fits into their budget as well. So that's a very good uh, partnership that we were able to secure as well. So, and then that concludes the overview of uh, the sports tourism. So if you guys have any questions, I will open it up. And all of the tournaments that you saw, they are going to be held accountable to our COVID-19 restrictions. So there will be limited spectators and all of the things that we have in place for our current leagues, uh, they have a great right. Can you ask me a question? Sure. I did. I, I think I answered it. You can expand upon it. She just said, where is this project? Where is money coming from? I responded, and you tell me if I'm off base, I think it's a high level discussion to say we would like to pursue this in the future. But you want to expand upon that. Um, exactly what you shared. The reason that we bought this to you today is because for your retreat, of course, we celebrate the accomplishments that we've been able to have over the last year or so, but we also identify where are we going for the next three to five to 10 years. Uh, this is a project that has been brought to us, of course, by some individuals in the private sector, and also some foundations. And we're the subject matter experts. So we feel that if this is a project that is going to come to our county, we would like to take the lead in those discussions and identify the possibilities and opportunities. So that is the purpose of today, is to do high level. You know, what is sports tourism? What are we currently doing? And a, a more sustainable operating um, capital budget in the future. We feel this is a good opportunity from a revenue standpoint to scratch the surface of something that we already done before. So, just kind of the discussion is almost kind of kind of goes with capital improvements also as yes. well. So it's kind of like I know on Monday night we get together again because. You know, we get a lot of conversation. You know, Steve and I have traveled all over for soccer, um, different parts, and obviously Rock Hill, they they got a massive soccer park too. 
the top of that stuff that you showed. So, and I've seen what the tourism does, but or I think you all have here. And so, kind of goes into the conversation about tennis facilities, which can become a tourism dollar type situation, but how do we improve them? Blah, blah, blah. And I think um, we should probably just have an open point about that on Monday. Definitely. And what you will receive on Monday will be an overview. The brain will be sharing with you where we are, um, what we've identified for priorities, but we're not asking for a vote or anything for capital improvement or operating. But we want to come back and do a work session to really get into our capital improvement needs as a county. We all know that it was great to get the $50 million bond that was previously issued, but there are still several facilities that were never addressed. And in addition, there are new opportunities that we feel will be beneficial to the overall county. So this is the year for that discussion. We are going to be looking at our comprehensive tenure plan as well. And the county is working on their tenure comprehensive plan. So timing is, is everything. And I think that it's important if you, if you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. So that's what we're trying to do is to stay ready, have our plans, so that when there are opportunities for funding, grants, and partnerships, we have a plan that we can. I think one thing that when I look at this, I think about it. Facilities that have a lot of use during the day, during the week, but are multi-passing that you can now bring any day you think. I don't want us to have facilities where it's like they're just 40 days. Just yeah. because I want us to have things that people are using 24-7. And yeah, you become very, and travel sport becomes very important part of that. But also incorporating like, you know, build a big facility. You can walk into it. Definitely a balanced approach to it so that it is not only utilized for sports tourism, but still feeds into the community by which we serve, which will strengthen us in the long term. Working with the school system, uh, as we talk about the aquatics, we're embarking upon an aquatics feasibility study. We want to understand aquatics in the entire county um, and our outlying areas. So do we need to continue going after outdoor pools or should we be looking at incorporating an indoor facility um, as a part of the overall campus where we can actually have swim teams and swim culture here in, in South Carolina. Well, yeah, I, com I compliment you guys on your contribution. Uh, having coached in Richmond County for a number of years uh, and looking at the tournaments is coming in and, and we securing funding from that. Uh, that's, a, that's a good start. Also, I was at uh, Northland Park on last Saturday. And, um, doing some baseball with some kids. But it was another group out there utilizing the field. And I think if coaches are coming in, charging kids money, then we should be able to recoup something from that. And we have been having problems with it. I'll be honest with you, not only the outdoors, we found it happening when we opened up the facilities for families to come in. So we are trying to stay ahead, but thank you. When you see that, feel free, send me a text message <laughs> and I'll um, make sure that we communicate with them because we have found that we've had independent contractors that are um, doing coaching and receiving payments at our facility. So if you're seeing that, please share with us because we do think that it's our facility. But if you're recouping the cost off of it, there should be a balanced approach. Then, with um, one with what Coach was saying, is um, with the consultant, they were looking at not pricing us out either. So when we charge a certain amount for our park facilities now, when we build a new facility, it's not going to be that it's $100 an hour to rent it because then we're competing against ourselves and that just doesn't make sense. Right. So the consultant mm -hmm. understands that because it's all one entity. So we're not going to price ourselves out, but we also want everybody to utilize it. So we can have one location where we have our rep basketball league at one location for that, or we start an uh, indoor volleyball league at one location, and then we can cater to the AU club teams at the park site, but we have one central hub for all sports to do that for the youth for recreation. Yeah, I agree with Coach Lee, not locking those kids up that can't pay for the youth. It's definitely been. Um, a, trend, a changing dynamic over the last 15, 20 years, um, the relationships with competitive sports and select sports and community sports. 
So what we're trying to do is try to be the hub for all sports in our county and work with those groups without, um, like you said, costing out our, our citizens that can't afford those groups. I think we really have to try to get this kind of stuff going as possible, whether it's the bylaws or the policies or stuff like this. Like I'm tired of talking about it, but I also want to see it. Move. Yes, I have a list over here that says action items that I'll be reading at the end. But yes, I totally agree. But like, it's important that we share. Absolutely. And getting you the information so that you all can make informed decisions on the things that we're doing. But thank you, Matthew. Are there any other questions for Matthew? Thank you. All right. So um, I know that our chair will be stepping out. And uh, we will continue to move forward our next presentation, which will close. And we will have our public information officer, Mrs. Jay Russell. She's going to close us out with all that good news of, you know, what have we done over the last year? You know, how have we continued to serve the citizens at a high level? And I am pleased to say that we have. Um, we truly appreciate you all as board members for your support in our endeavors, but I need to shout out my staff. I have an awesome team of professionals, and we have metamorphosed over the last um, almost three years. I can't believe it's going to be three years this year. And a lot of things people don't see in the public, but I would like to say publicly that this team rocks, and they give 150%. And what you see here today and what you will hear is touches every part of our agency. And you'll get to really uh, see what your team is doing. So, uh, Jane, go to read. Okay. Where is it? Where is it? All right, so this is the annual report, and this annual report will also be on our website, but there will be printed copies. There will be a the electronic and uh, also a written copy, a printed copy to the delegation. I have one problem with what Lawrence was saying. I think that we need to share with them what it is that we've accomplished and I'll get our chair to write a nice letter and then they'll be able to see where we are. And I think that will help us uh, move forward with helping them make some decisions. I have started attending the county council meetings prior to the pandemic uh, myself or to meet with, and sometimes even rain we will go because instead of just showing up when we want money, we wanted them to see that we are a part. I do plan on attending the legislation meetings. Uh, of course, I need to wait. I'm excited. I have an awesome deputy in Tamika. I don't have to even give it a second thought. I know it's going to be done. And she can continue to handle a lot of our day to day while I do do what you all want me here to do. And it's build stronger relationships and build stakeholder um, partnerships with our community. So I want to again publicly thank my awesome deputy who keeps it rolling for me. I truly appreciate her. And um, she made sure that today was great with Jamie. So. Jamie, um, yeah, thank you and all your team for turning the for you. Good afternoon to the board. Uh, I am tasked with giving you our 2020 fiscal year annual report. And so we have done, have been able to do some great things amid COVID-19, which is what I want to highlight. I've already given you some numbers in our October meeting from the annual report, but I want to talk about some of the things we were able to get accomplished. First of all, in our fiscal year 2020, uh, we were able to create a team that is creative, diverse, innovative, and experienced. And because we have such a great leadership team, we are now trying to make sure that our staff mim mimics the leadership that we have. And as a result of that, you'll find that we are Parks and Rec. This is one of the uh, brackets that we use as we celebrated National Park and Recreation Month, where we were able to take comments from different members of our staff and use them on our social media. And so the way that we're able to mirror this great leadership team that we have, we have a path now that you all have adopted with our vision, our mission, and our strategic plan. And with that vision, we are not just trying to be the state leader. We are trying to be a national leader, where we are providing evidence-based recreational programming, safe and accessible facilities, and customer service excellence. And we do that because we're dedicated to enriching lives and connecting communities through diverse recreational opportunities. And though we have this path, that path is governed by a compass. And that compass is our core values. Our core values are accountability, responsibility, 
Again, customer service, excellence, teamwork and balance, which you can see, even though we've been working all week, our team is still here today. Integrity and honesty, open and effective communication, nurturing, compassion, and empathy. Just simply put, we take action at RCRC. And so with our agency, we have just a little bit over 968 acres of land. Of course, our administrative building and a plethora of buildings and sports complexes in our inventory. And it's broken down into four divisions, administration, property management, recreation, and community relations. And of course, here with our strategic plan on this path, we have several action items. And I think Ms. Watson's going to do an activity about that a little bit later on in another time. Um, that, so that those can be prioritized based upon what our board has as their desire. And so as we're developing our team, one of the most important things is professional development. And that has been accomplished this year with training and educational opportunities, not only externally, but internally as well. We have had all of our staff to complete a diversity and inclusive training, which is a very important topic, especially now in our, our entire staff was able to complete that training. We've also had first aid and CPR and AED training, as well as OSHA safety training uh, in our in, NRPA Premier Member webinar series, as well as the True Colors training, which deals with conflict navigation. And of course, we are a great team, but there are sometimes when conflicts do arise. And so we have had several trainings, and not even just um, with external training, but also internal. And as a part of our core values, we are making sure that our staff is more accountable. And our finance department, as well as our human resources department, have been working to increase accountability, where we have upgraded our system with timekeeping. It is now electronic timekeeping. And also our asset purchases and program data collection is now electronic as well. And I'm going to show you some of the figures and numbers that we're able to produce now because our systems have been upgraded. Our equipment has been replaced and upgraded, which has allowed us to streamline our communication processes and monitor productivity. In our property management department, we now have a system where we are able to track our work orders, how long it takes our repairmen to complete those orders. And so our park superintendent is able to prioritize and based on the performance of our repairmen to see where we even may need some additional training if we are not able to complete those in a timely fashion. Also, we're very excited about our partnerships, sponsorships, and grants. One of our biggest uh, contributions this year has been with T-Mobile. They offer, have given us, and we have received it and cash, that check for $20,000. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, uh, Ms. Lisa Lewis Hutchison has been working very hard, but we've also been able to centralize, being able to track when our sponsorships and our partnerships and our grants are done. And so we did a great uh, event with SCE TV, as well as we have been working with Harvest Hope because we understand our community, some of our community is suffering through some. And so we want to be there to help them. Help, Healthy Blue has been phenomenal. And also Humana has been working with us because we were able to complete our senior games in a COVID safe way, which was very, very good. Office Depot, and look, we, we are not, uh, we don't discriminate. We went to Office Depot and Staples. So <laughs> even though they may be competitors, we'll take it wherever we can get. So both of them were able to uh, donate not only in-kind service, but also financial donations. Home Depot and Lowe's, and they are working with us with our after school program classrooms. Because one of the things we found is that we, uh, some of our buildings are not as inviting. And so we're trying to make sure that our buildings, even though we don't have a lot of money to make a whole lot of renovations, we're going to do some cosmetic things. And these companies have seen the need for that and have offered uh, supplies to us as well as monetary donations. Hot 103.9, Jimmy John's Red Rooster Sports Bar and Grill. Tri-County Electric Cooperative and USTA. So we're very excited about all the partnerships. Kind donations. Uh, we've had about $26,000 that we have received. Uh, in monetary, $23,000. It's a little bit higher than that. In our grants, a uh, minimum of $13,000. And in our partnerships, about $10,000. So we're really, really excited about the things that we are able to do here at RCRC. I told you that we've upgraded our systems, and so 
With that, we were able to see in fiscal year 2020, which runs from July 1, 2019, until June 30th, 2020, that we had 56,107 citizens scan into our buildings in order to participate in our activities. Now, that is not including um, any community leagues. These are just members of the community that have come in and scanned their memberships into our building, which our memberships currently now are free. And so that's 56,000 of the over 410,000 citizens. So I think we're doing pretty well. And in our private rental reservations, we've had 29,166 hours booked of private rentals. Now that is, of course, part of that was COVID, but the majority of that was prior to COVID. So we're really excited about the participation and the fact that we're able to track who's coming into our buildings. And I'm so glad that the vision was there for that because now it's very important that we are in the middle of a pandemic. We talked about previously about our core uh, programming requirements, uh, programming categories that we Make sure that all of our programs fall under one of these categories. And I stated before that we, we've given you some numbers in a previous meeting, but I also want to talk a little bit about what we've been doing in COVID in those areas of programming. Most importantly, our human resource department and our executive team were making sure that we could return back to work in COVID operations and making sure that that was safe and secure. So our HR department did a phenomenal job helping to make sure that we had all of the things in, in place so that our, our employees employees were a little fearful, but they did everything they could, even with implementing some different sessions from EAP, which helps us to manage the stress during this time of COVID. Also, our IT department was making sure that we had the right equipment and that we could safely and securely connect to the agency from home so that none of our data would be compromised. And then also while we were out, we were learning how we can do better at our performance management while we were at home and implementing this tool that has been put in place even amid COVID. So your team has been working. Also, our community outreach uh, department has worked to do six rec to go events where over 500 children were served and we were also able to coordinate with the USDA partner where they also received a meal and mask again during COVID. We participated in National Night Out, even though that date was pushed out from August to October, but we still were able to serve 250 children with meal. At St. Andrews, we were able to execute a day of caring where we served over 200 children in a drive through experience for a holiday toy giveaway. And we also had our breakfast with Santa. And if you haven't seen our uh, pictures online, you'll notice that Santa was in a snow globe. So even he was safe during COVID-19. <laughs> our senior resources, we, we saw that they had a need because they had low supplies. And so again, in community outreach, uh, over 750 pounds of supplies and toiletries and things were filled. We called it the Fill the Box Initiative. Our employees, as well as the public, were able to contribute to make sure that our seniors were taken care of. We also did Harvest Hope uh, a donation collection, and that this year was in connection with Famously Hot. So everyone that bought in some donations, we also were able to give them a bag of goodies for, the, for New Year's Eve celebration where they could virtually connect and uh, still be able to party, even though they could not be in, in one space. And as a result of the fees that were paid from the citizens, there was a $100 donation that was taken from those proceeds as a part of that Memorial Day to give back to Harvest Hope. So we're definitely concerned about the community. Our national night out participation, uh, of course, again, we talked about those 250 kids. Now, I, I told you before, our seniors are so important to us because when we look at the numbers, one of our one of our facilities is the one we're in right now. We see so many seniors that we decided to do a senior drive-through event, and they were elated because they have been home for months and have not been, had not been able to get out. And so amid COVID, we were able to do those drive-throughs and just have the staff stand out and wave to them and give them some things they could use in COVID-19. There were six back-to-school bashes. We've done outdoor recreation. 
our, our outdoor our adult and youth sport, sports were still in play, as well as our community leagues. And when we first began uh, COVID, uh, uh, we actually had from our health and wellness department where we did online on social media, and we got a great response for that. And again, I'd already stated that we had uh, two virtual 5K walks. And I told you we're innovative, because you can see that our seniors weren't, in, they weren't comfortable inside, so we took them outside to those tennis courts so they could still get to their low-impact exercise. During COVID, I do want to highlight that in our fall youth soccer program, even though our numbers were a little down, we still had 200 participants. And I want to highlight that because that means that they trusted us to bring their children to us. Uh, we didn't make them register, but they chose to register. And so we were able to serve 200 participants. Our fall adult kickball, which is 60 participants. Our fall adult softball was 50. And winter basketball, 400 participants. Again, they still trust RCRC. And our tennis, 40 participants. And I, I do want to go back to that one of our major activities because here we have 6,000 in COVID, I told you the original number was 59,000, but in, in uh, mid COVID, we had 6,500 that have scanned into our buildings since July 1, 2020 until the end of the year, December 31st. And our senior residents at Park Lane, it's 10% of our, our previous patrons that are still visiting our facilities. At the beginning of COVID, one of the innovative ideas was to do pool reservations. And as a result of that 6,576 citizens, 35% of those visited our pool. So even though we were all a little bit on the edge of COVID, we still understand the importance of recreation and took those chances. Even though our hours were 29,000 in the fiscal year, amid COVID, we've been at 10,429 hours of our rentals. And we have been able to have three sites where over 1,000 hours of COVID-19 testing has begun at our facilities. And this picture here highlights our senior games, which again, they are outside of their cars, still ready to exercise, making sure that we have the COVID measures in place and they, they seem pretty excited. This is our rep to go event. So we took um, recreation equipment and gave it out to the children because they couldn't get to us. This is also serving them their meals. And this was actually at our administrative building, which we had a huge line of people. And this is one of our back to school bashes where the Richmond County Sheriff's Department has been such a committed partner to RCRC. And this is one of our sponsors, SCETV, which was also giving out books and other paraphernalia to our children through our drive through So we've been pretty, pretty busy amid COVID and we are going to continue to hope that you will trust RCRC to climb the stairs and move to a higher vision and higher heights. Thank you so much. So members of the board, um, that concludes our presentations today um, to you. Uh, we are prepared for Monday, looking forward to Brandy, along with myself and Gary and so the lead presenters to bring to you your operating budget with uh, various scenarios for consideration, as well as that discussion for capital improvement, plan, budget, and our future. Uh, we are excited, and I hope that you are as well. And now we will uh, stop talking, I'll stop talking, so that you can share um, anything that you would like to receive additional information on, or if there are any comments. And then I'm not sure, I think that we do have our advice chair who is online as well. So I will be quiet and we can start with our vice chair if that works for you all. All right, vice chair, Ms. Gonzalo Lindsay. Does that if you can unmute? Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. Yes. Oh, okay. I enjoyed the session and thank you very much for all the participants. And I'm looking forward to hearing you Monday. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Mm -hmm. Madam Commissioner, Ms. Lisa Pine. Um, 
same comments. It was a um, great session. Enjoyed it. Very informative. Um, looking forward to Monday. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Clark. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I compliment you guys again. Uh, you and your team uh, and the job well done. I had an opportunity uh, last weekend to go see the uh, recreation basketball the process in which the uh, staff allowed me to come in, got my temperature checked, uh, to watch them spray down in between games. Uh, spoke with staff, they were comfortable. Um, early on, they, they may have had some issues with a, uh, an outbreak, but they, they handled that and got it documented, got the kids separated. It wasn't a big, any big outbreak, but I was impressed with their knowledge and the staff to take if something was to happen um, to keep not only the staff safe, but uh, the public safe as well, especially the kids. I spoke with the um, referee who's calling the game. He felt comfortable. He's been calling the game since uh, the league started. Um, just impressed. Um, like I say we have to find some sense of normalcy during this critical time and also ensure the staff safety and uh, Save the public as well. Great job. Thank you, sir. Coach Lee. Uh, excellent presentation. I think it speaks to the kind of team and culture that you all are building together. And uh, that's that's really important because the places this agency was on when a lot of its board members were brought on was not in a good place. And it's just uh, just looking at the policies that you have to work on that weren't, um, that weren't around. Um, you can see why there were issues in the past and how much work you guys have done already to correct that. Uh, I wish people could see more information like um, all the stuff that you guys have done and with Harvest Hope and, you know, people are more aware of all of the work that you guys are doing. Um, I think, you know, uh, the presentation that was given was phenomenal for showing that. And I just, I just really wish people knew more of what a great job we're doing. But I want you guys to really just keep working hard at what you're doing because um, when we look at our mission, you know, connecting people, I think that's what the pandemic has taught us is that how much, how important it is to connect in a healthy way, not an unhealthy way, but in a healthy way. Um, I think that it's awesome that that's in our mission and we need to protect our mission, our vision of using data and um, making sure that we're really connecting people um, in our community. Over 56,000 our whole hundred. Residents are using it over 108 people. Better than 108 people are using our stuff. That's that's phenomenal. We just got to keep going. Is that, that that's what's going to bring our health back? Great work. Keep going. Keep. Well, thank you all again, and again, thank you to all the staff, the people behind the scenes, the guys behind the camera that people don't get to see, as well as all of the team that's here today from community relations and recreation. Um, we believe in what we do. Thank you.